Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. How about I turn the microphone on? <laughs> evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's town hall uh, on behalf of Garrison Commander Colonel Sapp, Garrison Command Sergeant Major Andre Welch. I'm Chad Jones, uh, the Public Affairs Officer here at Fort Meade. And we're here tonight to talk about our schools and our school community as a whole. This town, town hall is one of several steps we have taken to improve our schools and communication with our parents. As we are, uh, as we got started today, we were very happy with the number of you that are here today and family. So really, thank you all for coming out today and braving the rain. It's uh, fantastic. Uh, we are honored to be joined by representatives from Anne Arundel County Public Schools. We have Dr. Daryl Kennedy, who's the superintendent of the cluster. We have Mr. Eugene Whiting, who's the principal at MacArthur Middle School. And we have Mrs. Vanessa Bass, who's the resident leadership coach uh, for the school. Additionally, we have our new school liaison officer, Ms. Meredith McCandless. And we also have representatives from our provost marshal's office. You're going to hear from uh, Lieutenant Colonel Brimage a little bit later. And also from our staff judge advocate uh, in regards to any questions we might have that go into legal realms. The itinerary for tonight is pretty simple. We're going to start off with a briefing. Colonel Sapp's going to open up with some opening remarks. Then you're going to get some information from Meredith in regards to how to work with the school and the school liaison office. Then the uh, AACPS has a few presentations and some information they want to give. And then finally, Colonel Brewer is going to talk about some of the law enforcement aspects and things that are that are tied to the schools that I know a lot of you all have been asking us through our through our various forums. After that, um, it's going to go to the question and answer portion. I would ask, so tonight's event, we're not live streaming, but we are recording and we do plan on editing it down and pushing this out so the rest of our parents can see what was discussed today. So with that, once we get to the question and answer period, we have our microphone set up here. If you could please come and ask your question at the microphone. What we would like you to do, we know it's a sensitive topic. Um, so what we would like to do, one question, one follow-up and then let the next person who has a question come up if you have a repeat or if you have a question that you didn't get to ask your first time up you are more than welcome to come back in line to ask that question again we just want to make sure we get through everybody and then make sure that we have chances for follow-ups we're scheduled to be here for 90 minutes but i know colonel sat pretty well over the last six months he tends not to leave until everybody has gotten their issues resolved, and then obviously we'll also be able to sit here and talk. Um, it looks like we already went through, we had some information sheets out here, some fact sheets and things, so hopefully you were able to pick those up. If not, we will make those available online uh, as we go through. Um, and the last thing I want to say, I know there's some issues that have happened at our schools. I know I've been here for 12 years. I know schools are a sensitive topic, but to just please remember to be respectful in our discourse because everybody up here on stage is I think everybody here wants to make sure that we're providing our students the best and safest educational opportunities possible with the school so we can keep that in mind when we're doing our discourse uh, today I think that we'll, we will be able to get even more accomplished so with that it is my honor to introduce our garrison commander Colonel Sapp Okay, if I talk like this, can those in the back hear me? Okay. Let's get a little closer, sir. They raise their hands if they can hear. Okay, for the sake of the camera. Oh, I appreciate it. Uh, I will tell you, so while I recognize, of course, that this is a school-focused town hall, uh, it is part of it and why we have everybody here today, and I'm sure why we have a lot of interest is some of the news that came up over the last three weeks. Uh, I will try my best to refrain from overly smiling because I'm probably the most skeptical Pollyanna that you'll ever meet, but I'm still a Pollyanna and I'm really excited to see so much of our community here tonight and engaged and that really does excite me. So thank you all for coming out and I hope that there are many engagements where you're able to continue to help uh, get, in get informed by us and inform us as well. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say that I I, this is my third trip to Fort Meade, so for those that haven't heard any of my other town halls, bio, or anything like that, uh, I understand I am a product of this community as well, both uh, internal to being in Fort Meade as well as externally living at Odenton. And so uh, I, I say that because it will frame, right, and we all talk from what our 
understanding is. Sometimes that's understanding you get by reading, and sometimes it's understanding by experience. And so I do have a lot of experience at, across what means stemming back to 2010. But I wanted to say that in particular, that anybody who has questions, uh, not everybody wants to be recorded and online. And there can be both personal and professional reasons why that may be. And we don't want that to be an obstacle to people being able to ask, which is why we decided since this is the first town hall we've had possibly ever since most of these started around COVID time and were virtual, uh, that we're trying to be respectful of that, which is why we're recording and then we'll post later. So if you have a question and do not want to actually be recorded, uh, you can pass a note to somebody else to ask. Uh, but you can also just let Brian, please raise your hand. That is our videographer. You may recognize him from the Mead Weekly wrap-ups that he does each week. They uh, talk to him and just say, hey, I cannot be on camera online. Uh, we'll absolutely respect that. We understand that. Okay, so with that, one of the things that I'm going to hand off pretty quickly to, to the partners up here to answer. When, if this table could have fit all of us, uh, I would have had the provost marshal, uh, Chad didn't introduce him because for most of the community have children, he doesn't need an introduction. But Fran Jameson, Fran please stand up. Uh, Fran Jameson is our CYS, Child and Youth Services Director. For anybody who has daycare age children, that's usually where they know Fran, because, but he is more than that. It is all the child and youth programs. The school liaison falls under his domain, our sports programs fall, school age centers, the teen center. Uh, there, anything that is about child and youth falls in his domain. And I say that because uh, there's a big part of this. We have the Parent Advisory Council uh, that most people recognize as CDCs, but it's not just about that. So there are opportunities to stay engaged on a monthly basis with other venues that help communicate up through us. So with that, I will hand it over to, uh, let's see. Oh, and then the other person I wanted to introduce, Sergeant Major, please. Stand up and up. Oh. Sergeant, Command Sergeant Major, welcome. If, uh, if you're Army, you understand Command Sergeant Major. If you have no nexus to military, um, just know that he is my right-hand man. I've got my deputy on my left, Sergeant Major on the right, and the three of us are as a command group. And so we will continue to do everything we can to ultimately run, run this base, but it's about the safety and security of the mission and of the personnel that reside and work on this installation. And so before I hand it off, the last point that will be the recurring theme is that a strong partnership is the best way to keep our students safe. And so we are here tonight because we all have, every one of us that's in this theater has a vested interest in creating a space where our children can learn, where they can develop, and then we can set them up for success as adults. And that's why we're here. So, thank you. I'll hand directly off to Meredith. I do have a teacher's voice. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Good evening. Um, I'm going to say my name again because I'm a brand spanking new in the position. Uh, Meredith McCandless. I'm the new school liaison officer taking over for the uh, Sarah Bunnies, who's happily retired. So I brought handouts that were down in the front. If you did not get them and you want some, email me. My business card is right down there. I will send them electronically. They were on homeschooling. And also, there were several articles on how to talk to your children about school safety, because it's you know a very touchy subject, so there's ways to broach it. Um, since Colonel Sapp disclosed that he's a Pollyanna, I'm going to disclose that I'm a realist. So I tend to be the one always saying, mm, yeah, but, and questioning things. So for your benefit, for, your, for this community, I just want you to know that. So um, a couple of things that I wanted to touch on is a couple topics that were brought up at the last town hall in the discussions. One of them was the homeschooling. There's been an uptick in interest for the homeschooling. So if you have an interest that's something you want to pursue, come see me. I've done all the research on it. I can guide you through how to get started um, and how that process works. 
The second thing is there's also been some talk about why aren't we DODIA schools? That's how you pronounce it, right? DODIA? Um, I'm going to let you know right here tonight why Fort Meade School or Anne Arundel County Public Schools on the Fort Meade installation will not become DODIA schools. DODIA schools have criteria. One of them is a percentage of military children. We don't reach that threshold of percentage. The second is there needs to be a greater distance where a school from the state or county or community is accessible. We have too many schools that are accessible. And we really don't want to be a DODIA school. We want to be in the community involved. I think it's very important for civilian students to see military students. The other thing um, I wanted to clarify is and emphasize is just the uniqueness that Fort Meade is. It's such a unique community. We have four schools that have gate-only access. That's very rare in the whole country. You had brought the numbers uh, to one of our meetings. I don't remember what it was, but it was it was a very there's rare of the other bases that have four schools on their installation. So. Think about that uniqueness, embrace it, and consider with that uniqueness, we need to collaborate and partner with both Anne Arundel County Public Schools and the County Police Department in anything with the school system. So with that, I will send it over to our reps from Anne Arundel County Public Schools. Thank you very much. Can, there, can everyone hear me? Yes. Fantastic. Uh, the Colonel talked about the partnership between the Anne Arundel County Public Schools and Fort Meade, and it is a special partnership. A little bit about myself, I am Daryl Kennedy. I am the uh, Regional Assistant Superintendent for the Meade Cluster. Before I took this position, I had the pleasure of being an assistant principal at Fort Meade High School from 2002 to 2006, and then I was the principal from 2006 to 2012. So I, I had firsthand experience as far as the partnership, and uh, about you know a third of our students were military at the time, about 33 percent. And uh, as a father who was in the military, um, but you know when when I was born, he was he had already got out. Uh, that was my first real experience of of, of having the pleasure of working with families, um, you know, in, on the base. Uh, he lived on the base in the 1950s and 60s and, and he would talk about Fort Meade. So there were many times when we would drive out and, and, and come on the base for different activities where he would bring this. And it was just nice to, to, to have that gathering with him. So Fort Meade is special to me and my family for many reasons. My father was stationed here, uh, he lived here, and then obviously, you know, I was a principal at, at Maine High School. Um, and that was, again, the, the most exciting time in my life, right? Since I left Meade High School, I went to Baltimore City, and I, but I had the pleasure to come back and the chance to come back, and I did it. So why is Meade High School so special to me? Well, it is the largest uh, student uh, body, a uh, clutch of students in the in the, uh, in, Ronald Potty, in the Ronald County Public Schools. We have the largest cluster. We have about 8,401 students with 13 schools. That's the largest of any cluster in Anne Arundel County. Why also is it special uh, to me and many folks in the Meade cluster? Because it's the most diverse. 16% of our students are, are white, 43% uh, are black, 29% are Hispanic, 7% have are multi-race, 4% Asian, and, and we have 1% of, of other uh, students with other nationalities. Um, and that's that was it makes us unique, right? There's there's other clusters that have you know a, a variety of different students like that, but there's none that has our our diversity, and that's something that we celebrate. Uh, we celebrate our military students. We celebrate our non-military students, and, and you know many of our schools uh, have different students that fit those two parameters. Why also is the meat cluster uh, special? Just as a background. We have more special academic programming than any other cluster in Anne Arundel County. Uh, for elementary schools, uh, there's something called Triple E. Um, we have schools in the Meade cluster with themes of arts and humanities and STEM, global studies and world and culture and language. Uh, and that's very, very distinct and special for elementary school age children. Uh, it's something that we're very proud of and those themes Get, have kids at a very early age just focus on some of the things that really pique their interest. 
At the high school, we have the Homeland Security Program. Now, I, as principal, I, I brought that program in. There was the first signature program in Anne Arundel County, and that Homeland Security Program is nationally known. Uh, Los Angeles, Chicago, uh, Orlando, there were articles written about how special that program is. So many of your students or children, excuse me, are a part of that program, and that is something that's very, very unique. So it's something that I know me high school is very proud of, and for Anne Arundel County Public Schools, there is no signature program like Homeland Security Program, right? With, especially with some of our resources and some of the partnerships that you all are a part of, too. Continuing with the special programs, uh, we do have AVID that's in all elementary, middle, and high schools. And again, those are just for students in the, in the middle, and they, they prepare themselves for college and career explorations. And then we have the International Baccalaureate Program. Uh, Mead High School has the diploma track, MacArthur has the MYP track, and Manorview and, and Hebert Harbin has the uh, PYP or the, uh, for the primary years program. Those programs are very, again, unique, right? Even at the elementary school level, they're developing critical thinking, right? The ability to work with others. Uh, and I love the vision, which is to build a community of schools, educators, and students um, to empower young people to work with each other. Uh, to, uh, to create a better and more peaceful world. And that's what the International Baccalaureate Program is all about. I share that, you know, as, as a, you know, at the beginning, just so we realize, like, how special our, our cluster is and, and what we have to offer. And for many of our students, you know, they experience the, the programming and do fantastic. Uh, I'm at the age now where I can see some of the fruits of my labor, labor where we have uh, a psychologist at MacArthur that graduated with me as a principal at Lee High School, where we have teachers uh, at um, North County that graduated from Lee High School, and they always remember some of the things that I say. Failure is not an option, right? You know, we talk about the diversity. Those are things that we preach, and those are the things that the kids are, are proud of. So I'm, I'm proud of being able to, uh, to reflect back and see some of the things. 92% of our students in the Mead cluster, right, this is elementary, middle, and high school, 92% of our students uh, come to school and as of December 31st have no behavioral referrals, right? Behavioral referrals are if you obviously get in trouble, right, a teacher or an administrator, someone can write a referral. We have 92% of our students in the Mead cluster that have no referrals. Uh, and I think that that's something, you know, that's important to, to understand. Uh, when we talk about Mead High School, um, and I think this is important as an overview, out of the 13 high schools, they're currently ranked seventh in the number of referrals that's written. Um, and then when you look at some of the, the fights that's going, that, that has happened, because I think it's just important to talk about, they're in the middle for high schools regarding that. Um, at this time, this time, this year compared to last year, Mead High School has cut in half the number of fightings that they've had at the school. They've done a fantastic job of of you know, realizing that students came back uh, last year and they had, there was an issue and they've done a, a great job of, of, of you know, doing, putting some resources in place to mitigate that. At MacArthur Middle School, uh, out of 19 middle schools, MacArthur right now is 13th in the number of referrals written. And regarding the fighting, MacArthur is 11th out of 19. And I don't want to minimize, and I'll talk about the event that's happening, but I, I also want to make sure that it's important to, to understand that uh, MacArthur is a safe place. Right, Mead High School is a safe place. And all the other schools in Anne Arundel County Public Schools are I mean, in the Mead Cluster are safe places too. As a matter of fact, uh, the principal at Mead High School at Mead Middle School, Carla Steinbach, I was just uh, notified today that she's won the Maryland School Professional Counselor's Principal of the Year. So that's something that we're going to be recognizing as a system that we received today. So we have some fantastic principals. Um, Rebecca Blasser being white, who retired last year was the Washington Post Principal of the Year. We have about four or five that gets nominated and recognized. And she was, and she was one of ours. So we have fantastic leaders and fantastic teachers uh, in, the, uh, in the new cluster. Regarding the situation at MacArthur, uh, I think it's important that, we, that, you know, that I talk about it and then Principal Whiting talks about some of the things that's in place. You know, obviously I can't get into the details of, of the, the consequence for the students. Um, but as the letter uh, indicated, um, I can assure you that the student was um, 
uh, is, was discipline that was appropriate to our code of conduct. Uh, and, and in the code of conduct where it says student weapon, um, that's where you'll find like what the, the you know whatever kind of you do with students, um, and and I can assure you that 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 was followed. Um, regarding the situation, uh, as the letter said, the teacher uh, of the of the classroom where the student was in uh, noticed uh, that there was something off, and, and noticed that there was something that could have been in uh, in the possession. Uh, he, you know, took appropriate actions. And, and walked the student to the principal's office. And once he was in the principal's office, that's when the SRO was contacted, um, and, and that's when you know things were resolved from that from that point of view. Again, um, there was also something that was in the letter, and, and I've heard and we've heard a couple of times about several students seeing the gun earlier in the day. That was a little misleading, and I want to clarify that a little bit. Students. There was, uh, after we found out, probably about one or two students that did see it done, right, earlier than that. Uh, when you looked at the, the letter, um, one may have assumed that there were a plethora of people, but there were, after our investigation, there were about one or two students that we have verified that, that did see it done. And what we did as a central office is work with the administration, investigated that situation, and for those two, for those one, for those two students, uh, I'm thinking too because it was, it's a, you know, it, it was that our investigation found out it was two students, um, and when we we investigated uh, that situation with uh, with MacArthur Middle School, and then took appropriate action for our code of conduct. Right, there's an unsafe action part of it. We have to look at the unsafe action part of it. And then we have to like see what happened and, and, and look at the situation and then we took action. Um, so you know those are things that that have happened. Um, those are things that you know that we as as a system have zero tolerance for. Um, and you know I, I want to make sure that you know that you know because that has been asked of us that we took action about that. Before I talk about as a system what we're doing and what we continue to do to help MacArthur. I want to have Mr. Whiting talk a little bit about what the school has done uh, before and since that incident. All right. I thank you, Dr. Kennedy. Great to be here this evening. Again, I'm Gene Whiting, the principal at MacArthur Middle School. I've been there for 10 years. I'm the proud principal of MacArthur Middle School. Um, I'm also a product of Anne Arundel County uh, Public Schools. And it's interesting that you know I started my teaching career at me high school as a uh, permanent sub. So um, back in the day, before you had your degree, you had to start off as a permanent sub, and then as you finished your courses um, at, at the school, they uh, gave you the credit that was necessary, and I finally became a teacher, but I want to say that I started at Mead, Mead High School. Um, so I was one ecstatic person when I was promoted to principal at uh, MacArthur Middle School, just, you know, bringing it back around. Um, and because I'm a product of Anne Arundel County uh, Public Schools, um, I am proud to serve the uh, community and the students at MacArthur Middle School. Um, so at MacArthur Middle School, we, safety is number one. Um, our policy at the school is uh, no coats are to be worn in the hallway. Coats need to be placed in, in um, lockers. We're also a uniform school. So our sixth grade students wear red polo shirts, khaki pants. Our seventh grade students wear blue, and then our eighth grade students wear um, gray. Again, all students are given a locker. If any student has any problem um, purchasing a locker, we have them in the main office, and we happily give them to students when necessary. Um, our students, um, I'm proud to say that relationship building is very important at MacArthur Middle School, and students at the school know that the that there is always an adult that they can speak to, talk to when they're going through issues. Um, those adults being administrators, or the teachers, counselors, and we also have a position called an Alt-1, and those individuals support our administrators throughout the day. Um, we also have rules like uh, no hallway passes are allowed to be written the first 10 minutes or the last 10 minutes of class. Um, we also underscore uh, the importance of um, uh, seeing something and saying something. In all the classrooms at MacArthur Middle School, you'll see the Maryland Safe Tip Line posters that are up. So any student that wants to report anonymously 
uh, about something that may be occurring um, at MacArthur Middle School, they can do that. And also, we have all students within the school must carry a mesh or clear book bag, all right? No purses are allowed to be carried, no canvas bags, mesh or clear book bags. And that was actually instituted like five years ago. Um, so we continue on that road of the mesh and the clear book bags. And again, if students do not have a um, uh, mesh or clear book bag, we give them out for free. But you changed the fanny pack, or the fanny pack. Correct. That's right, right, right. Fanny packs I put in the same category as like a purse. That so the fanny pack, purses, anything like that must be put away in a locker and locked up throughout the day. It cannot be carried throughout the day. All right. So I know that at the beginning of each day, uh, Criswell Whiting or an administrator designate announcements and remind students and staff uh, of the guidelines that we just stated. Um, and, you know, that's something that, that is school wide too. In addition to what MacArthur is doing, um, as a central office, one of the things that, some of the things that we've done is, is assure that, uh, that MacArthur has their third Alt-1. He had talked a little bit about it. An Alt-1 is sort of like a, an assistant to the principal. Um, and MacArthur has three assistant principals and, and three Alt-1s. And one of the things that Mr. Whiting and I talked about at the end of last year was, was to add an additional person. Um, because of some of the staffing challenges, uh, an Alt-1 was promoted to an assistant principal in October, November. Um, and that was a good and one end, but, but on our end, it, it caused a, 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 a vacancy. Uh, so we were able to, to fill that vacancy uh, free, uh, just recently. We also have four individuals from central office uh, that, are, that have been sent to, to MacArthur to help teach the classrooms. MacArthur, uh, we have a couple of other middle schools that, are, that, are, that have some uh, teacher shortages, right? And uh, MacArthur probably has currently now about 15 to 17 like vacancies that, that, that have been tough to fill, right? And that's down from 22, 23 earlier. Um, and, you know, that is a problem with our middle schools. You know, MacArthur, Lindale, Annapolis, O'Neill Middle North, uh, like teachers and, and vacancies and staffing has been a problem. That, I would have thought it would have been the high schools, right, but, but it's the middle schools. Um, so one of the things that I know that our superintendent uh, is, is tasking all of us to do is continue to come up with creative uh, ideas for, for how to help support the staff the building. Uh, and that's going to be an ongoing thing. Um, it's going to be something that we're about to, you know, do a better job of, frankly, for next year. Because, um, you know, it, it, may not, it may not go away, so we're about to be creative as far as how we, how we do that. And that's what we're in the process of doing now. Uh, we do have two uh, mentors uh, that are starting on Friday. They're going to be introduced to the staff. These individuals I've worked with before. Uh, and they, uh, a male and a female, are, are, you know, contracted to work with some of our students that need support uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, it could be for social emotional reasons, it could be for behavioral reasons, it could be for academic reasons. Uh, so, you know, they're going to be uh, uh, talking again with the administration tomorrow, and then on Friday, uh, they're going to be introduced to staff. We have one of the females that have already got the base access. The, the male, we're still working through the process. So we'll, we'll be able to start uh, with at least one of the individuals on, uh, on Friday or Monday of next week. Um, we also were, were fortunate enough to have Ms. Bass. Uh, Ms. Bass is a former principal, former uh, HR senior level position uh, from Anne Arundel County. Principal at Mary Malls. Assistant principal at Lynn Burney, I know a teacher at Lee High School knows the base and afford very, very well. Uh, and she's going to be staying on uh, at MacArthur for the remainder of the year. Um, you know, one of the things that our, again, our superintendent is, is, is very much committed to is to make sure that if we're having staffing issues at some of the, the buildings, what can we do to help support it anyway? So Ms. Bass is going to be here, um, and I'll give her a chance to say something if she, if she wishes in a couple of seconds. Um, Finally, there's a there's a committee that we're that we're doing at Central Office to deal with like students that are having uh, some behavioral issues coming back from uh, from from the uh, from the pandemic and it's not over. But coming back from that has been challenging, uh, challenging in the county, challenging in the state, and as we know, challenging in the nation. 
Um, and it's something that we're going to have to, as a, as a community, work together. So as a, as a you know, central office and school system, we are looking at short and long-term problems for students that, that may have some issues that we just have to, like, you know, obviously deal with. Um, we also want to be looking at some creative ways that we can do to help support the schools. Um, Ms. Bass, do you have anything you want to add? I'll be the mic. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't like really talking sitting. And people that work with me every day, they know that. But I'll do the mic just because keep conformity and consistency. Yeah. Two minutes. Oh, two minutes. Okay, I'm good. Two minutes. Great. I'm coming back. I taught at MacArthur from 1980 to 1988. I tell how long I did that because I had a baby there. Um, literally, I taught 246 till I had the, the kid. I got home, but I love your kids. I'm passionate. I'm passionate about your kids. This is year 45 for me. My second tour of duty. I came back as the resident coach, so I will be staying until June. I love middle school. Most people don't say that, but I think it is the trend. Stop. She's shaking her head. head. No, I, I love that you love middle school. Transitional. That's the idea about, I was in junior high dating myself. It's transitional. So the kid that you send from fifth grade to sixth grade, and on this corridor, we had seven and eight when I was here in the eighties. Because the sixth grade stayed at the middle school, because we really didn't have me middle school. But now it's six, seven, eight. So it's transitional. We work with the transitional kid. I always say the kid that you sent to middle school will not be the kid that goes to high school. So parents, feel free to call me. I'm every day, 24 7. I tend not to go to bed. I'm a little ADHD, unmedicated. So if you need me, if you need me, call me. I'm there every day, and I love the military. I gotta say, I'm a military mom. We a mixed family. Marine, 29 stumps. I know it has a different name, and Army, and now Air Force. So I'm so proud. Of that. I'm here to serve. At the end of the day, I just want to add one more part too, because I think that that's there's some questions that that I've fielded around like safety drills. And I do think it's important just to talk a little bit about that, that uh, each year, the, uh, all of our schools uh, conduct uh, drills once a month. And it can be anything from weather uh, drill to obviously uh, uh, to a person with a weapon in the school. So those drills are happening once a month. Uh, and when those drill, drills occur, uh, schools are actually great. Uh, we have our, our supervisor of security, Doyle Back, who's a former uh, you know, uh, Anne Arundel County police officer. Uh, grades them and gives them feedback on that. So that's something that's really good to take uh, talk seriously about. I've also been asked uh, about metal detectors, um, and you know, just to, to to make sure since I was asked that, um, you know, obviously at this time nothing has been communicated to to me that uh, that they're going to be in any of our schools. But it doesn't mean that that's not part, part of a conversation, right? Um, as as we do every year. Uh, security measures are always reviewed and, and looked at. So it's something that we just look at and we review it and have that every year. Um, so that's it. Uh, again, we're a community. It's going to take uh, all of us to continue the work that, that we do. Um, and as, as Ms. Bass said, you know, feel, please feel free to reach out. I have cards and I, I'll make sure that, that Chad has them uh, if you have any questions or concerns too. So I'll, I'll turn it back over. Thank you very much. Um, before, well, as Colonel Brimage covers up, um, two things. One, Mrs. Bass is outstanding. She's a, a leader of the Friends of Meat Initiative, which is uh, basically the whole entire community coming together to support the Meat Cluster School through advocacy, through hoping we did the Meat Strong Day over at Meat Middle School, things of that nature, to just highlight there are a lot of good things coming to me, but also get community support. So hopefully you can get, get involved with that. But as we go through, one question that we did have, Dr. Kennedy, and it revolved around SROs. Um, they are at the schools, but what is the limit? What do they do? What, what does an SRO do? I know they fall under county police, but how do they work with you and not just at MacArthur, but in the schools in general? And then I'll step back and let uh, our provost, Marshal Colonel Brimich, uh, provide some information. 
So I, I will talk like in generalities um, since I don't have like any of the, their job descriptions specifically. But SROs is a it's a uh, we have an MOU between uh, Anne Arundel County Public Schools and, and our police department, uh, where you know they are a part of of, of high schools and middle schools. Um, they are there really as support, right, as resources. Uh, obviously, if there's a, a law that's broken, uh, they are there to enforce them. Uh, but their primary, primary job is just to make sure that they're supporting students and obviously to ensure that the safety of the building is, is, is uh, you know, is, is taken care of. They are officially in Anne Arundel County. In case the mic didn't pick that up, we sure they are Anne Arundel County Police Department. So we just moved from Tampa before we came up here. Uh, Florida has the same program where it is county police that have a representative there because it's also part of the education to make sure to understand that just because somebody's in uniform does not mean it is the bad guy. Uh, that it is there to help build a relationship. So that's part of why it's a school resource officer. It's not the security guard. It's not the policeman on duty. Uh, speaking of, before I hand it over to my own policeman, uh, it, it, I'll be a little bit Mike, so I get comfortable. Okay. Speak. Yeah, it's, it's okay, but uh, uh, what I want to build on on some of what was said, but before I do that, as we get ready to go farther, I do want to check. So obviously it's a little easier to tell the children in the room, but I am curious with a, a show of hands, how many of you are faculty or administrators of the Meade schools? Okay, so I mean, please look around. That's, that's about a half, which is, is kind of what I expected. Now, you can raise your hand again. This is not exclusive. Is it? How many of you are parents here tonight and if you're faculty, please raise your hand again. Okay, about 75%. Uh, well, that raises more questions. I'm curious how many of you are on the two, three year cycle, and we can get into that. But uh, I think that's important for, and the camera's not going to show it because we promise we're not trying to advertise everyone. But that does point out to uh, I have my three C's. And if you haven't heard, uh, I call them the GC's three C's, Garrison Commanders three C's that I, I have made a big part of my command for these two years. And it's consideration, and it's ultimately just looking outside ourselves. It's more of the being contemplative, just stopping to think about what's around us, looking at situations with a different window. It's caring, and that is giving a darn about what we do, uh, about how we are in this world. And then it's about community. Because in the end, no one of us is an island, and that's the only way that we're going to succeed. When we look at the show of hands of who has a vested interest, uh, this is a partnership issue. This is not in any case an us-them, because there is no clear us-them. That we have faculty who are parents with children in the same school. We have parents who are volunteers. Some of you uh, may be interested because you're not even part of this cluster. You're part of, you live off base, go to a different school. I have a son who's in North County High. I have a daughter in Lindell Middle, and I have a daughter at Mead High. That daughter also went to MacArthur Middle as a sixth grader. As Dr. Kenny said, there's some of yeah, and that's why you know it's because she had to zip around in the scooter because we have a disability issue in the household, so she tends to make a name for herself as she goes around. But uh, the programs and opportunities are incredible. She took Mandarin Chinese as a sixth grader. Does the school still offer it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I haven't, I haven't asked that question since we got back, but as a sixth grader, she took Mandarin. She wanted to be in this IB program because she cared about the community she lived in. We moved to Augusta, Georgia, and her first question was, am I gonna get to take Mandarin when I get to Georgia? For those who haven't been to Georgia, they don't care much about Mandarin uh, and Augusta. And so, no, it was Spanish, French. I don't even know if they had German in the school at the time. But uh, so that was not a thing. There are incredible programs that the schools offer. But numbers are what matter. And you heard the, uh, Dr. Kennedy and Principal Whiting talk about some of the staffing issues. For those of you that raise your hands as faculty and administrators, I thank you. I know, so as a parent, I've been on, any one of us that has a kid anywhere in this county, 
knows about the three to four texts a day we get for bus issues. And I will tell you, when you have three kids at three different schools in different clusters, uh, it compounds the number of texts I get in emails. And I probably get about a dozen emails every day for bus shortages. That list went from something, I, I don't know what it's been, I think it may have been 70 buses that were not running at capacity as they were supposed to for service disruption, I believe is the phrase. Uh, I think it was about 70 because I wasn't looking. I was looking for the three that I needed to know. Now that list yesterday was 10. Now because of where my kids are, I still get all three texts for all three schools. But that was because of a concerted effort just to be able to get the workforce needed for drivers. Drivers are easier to find than educators, right? The credentialing can happen by the county to get someone to be a bus driver. That happens because of creative efforts by Dr. Bedell and his team to, in order to find vans that don't require the same level of certification as a bus driver in order to free up. So you put a van in this community over here that only needs eight students to be picked up. You've just freed up potentially a 30, 40 passenger bus that can now go somewhere else where that need is there. Anne Arundel County Public Schools had a very rocky start and has done everything to continue to make it better every day. But staffing is going to continue to be an issue, and it's an issue within our own child care. Our child care providers are at their wits' ends in many cases because of the staffing shortages and just trying to be able to get the kids that we need to take care of. So I bring that up because numbers matter and we continue to see improvement. Uh, Mead Strong is part of what the Friends of Mead with the, uh, with the school district came up with and we revealed it at the Mead Cluster Day, was it November? Yeah. It was just before Thanksgiving, I think we ended up there. We had to reschedule because weather was not kind to us uh, almost twice. But uh, so hashtag Mead Strong, if you see that out in the social media platform, that's not Fort Mead. That is the Mead cluster and the community with the Friends of Mead that includes the fort. But it is really part of something greater than just this fence line that many of you are familiar with. And so through that partnership, we'll continue to carry the load. Because if you've ever had, six people can carry a lot. One person goes down, two more call in sick that day. It just changes the dynamic. And so the more that we can get in the schools, uh, will ultimately ease the burden all over, and it will allow for the trust to continue to build with the students and the faculty, the faculty and the administrators, and then have eyes on where they need to be. Which leads me to, is we talk about many of the successes uh, that Dr. Kennedy went through. There are a lot of good things about the school. And I think many of you know that, or you wouldn't be here in the first place, uh, living on Fort Meade, because there's enough bad publicity out there that I see it all the time in social media spheres of, oh, don't come to the schools, and you're still here, which means you've recognized. You've already done a little more critical analysis and dug deep to see the good things. It does not mean that there wasn't something that scary happened and that we take serious. We are getting after that with preventative measures and an integrated partnership that will also allow us to be responsive because if a situation happens, and statistically across America, we're in a time where situations happen, so therefore we need to have responsive drills as well. And so that is, you ask questions and as we talk, that will be part of how we look at it. Are there some preventative measures that we, or proactive measures we've taken? Fanny packs and purses used to be allowed in MacArthur Middle. Uh, and there were reasons for it, there were arguments back and forth. As a result of this incident, they, have met, they are now in lockers. And there are because there are more people and we'll have other programs that are preventative to just have more adult eyes on the situation. And so if something feels off, uh, did we, I already missed it, did we announce the name of the teacher again? He doesn't want any publicity, the teacher that identified him. So uh, we're honoring what, what he wants. And uh, I mean, right, I would love to bring him on stage and uh, pin a medal on his chest. We do have a civilian kind of equivalent. Uh, but we're recognizing his wishes too. 
But part of the reason that it's not just having the teacher willing to do that, it's also having enough people that they can recognize when something seems off. And so that's part of what we're doing. So as a, a preventative measure, Ms. Bass, please feel free to raise your hand. But I'm curious how many people ever did an under the desk drill when they were in school. Well, there's some younger hands. I didn't do it. Fran, really? So the under the desk drill. Okay, <laughs> thank you. That that is far more hands than I thought. Uh, for those that have no idea what that even means, uh, right? A lot of us grew up in the Cold War, and the threat of nuclear war was real. And as a result, we took proactive measures. And one of the things that happened is we didn't. Now I grew up in Kansas. We did tornado drills. That was our biggest threat in rural Kansas, uh, because no one cared about bombing farm country where we were at. Uh, but there were schools all across the nation, earthquake drills in California. Now, unfortunately, because of the state of affairs that we have, active shooter drills are common. Bomb threat drills are common. And uh, my kids have done it in Hawaii, they've done it in Georgia, they've done it in Florida, they've done it here. Uh, this is not just a local issue. But the more the community can come together, the more we can make those feel like those unnecessary drills that we remind ourselves as kids it happened because all those preventative measures were in place and we didn't need to have the responsive ones. So with that, as we talk about security, I would like to, oh, Chad, you step back up. Did you want to say something? No, I, was, I was just filling okay. the space. Literal. Yes. <laughs> and I'll hand it over to my provost marshal, uh, which those that don't know is my law enforcement advisor for the staff. He is also the chief of our director of emergency services. Thanks, sir. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, Mike Brindage here, and uh, as Colonel said, the Provost Marshal, just thank you like the sheriff of the installation. Um, the chief of police uh, works for me, and uh, we're in charge of uh, physical security and fire in the installation. So our mission at the director of emergency services is to ensure the safety and security of Fort Lee community. And, uh, the Fort Lee community includes the schools. And uh, so I want to take a moment to, to talk to you all about uh, what we do and, uh, and what we will do going forward to ensure that uh, the community is safe, uh, specifically the schools in this situation. So as uh, Ms. McCann spoke, uh, spoke to earlier, uh, the, 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 the Fort Lee cluster is not a good deal school. Um, so with that in mind, uh, the, the jurisdiction component uh, can be a little bit complex. So uh, Fort Lee uh, schools are underneath Anne Arundel County, as you all know. And uh, with that, they also have the law enforcement jurisdiction of uh, Anne Arundel County Police Department. So Fort Lee Police Department, we're in charge of securing uh, essentially the, the perimeter of the school, for, for lack of a better, better term, for this audience. And what, what that consists of is making sure that uh, the outside of the school is safe and, uh, and, and free from criminal activity and, uh, and other acts uh, that are detrimental to the good order and welfare of Fort Lee. But what we do is we work uh, hand in hand with Anne Arundel County uh, to help support uh, the, the safety and security of the school. So um, some of the things that we do, we uh, support Anne Arundel County in conducting criminal investigations or criminal activity. Um, we assist in going through and uh, doing security checks. We also run the traffic uh, control zones in and around school. And uh, also, if needed, if requested, uh, we can increase our presence around uh, as, a, as a deterrent. And, and that's typically uh, a last option. Uh, nobody uh, actually wants to see that happen in, in any form of fashion. Uh, with Anne Arundel County, currently uh, with our legal team at Fort Lee, we have uh, a few memorandums of agreements. And what those memorandums of, of agreements are for is to ensure that we provide the best response uh, time um, as needed when called upon. Many times because of our proximity, although we are not primary jurisdiction uh, for apprehending people or searching uh, people. Um, 
we can't be the first responder. So our typical response time anywhere on Fort Meade is about three to five minutes. So if there is an incident that occurs on installation, we will most likely be the first people to arrive. And so those memorandums of agreement outline uh, how our partnership with Alabama County um, is to go forward. And so uh, we, we work hand in hand. We have strong communications with the SRO and uh, he is directly tied in to our dispatch center and to our chief of police. So typically our dispatch center and our chief of police would be the first per person, first people to get a call uh, in a crisis type of situation. Um, so with that being said, um, we have run the numbers uh, for, for just the school year based on the, the recent unfortunate situation that happened on uh, at uh, McCarthy Middle School. And uh, we can uh, definitely say that Fort Meade, uh, Fort Meade customers are definitely uh, safe. Um, there, there is no trend of high criminal activity uh, within the school system, within the Fort Meade cluster, uh, should I say. And uh, we expect that to keep going in light of uh, the unfortunate incident that, that has happened. Um, and I will finish with saying uh, if, again, we'll reinforce uh, what the gentleman had said up here earlier is uh, if you see something, say something. And that, that is our uh, model within DES as well. Um, sometimes if you have an inkling that something is not right, more than likely uh, you, you're probably right. And uh, feel free to give us a call um, with our non-emergency line if it's not an emergency. If it's an emergency, please call 911. And uh, my fire department will be out face out. What's that number for the non-emergency? Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, the number for the, the non-emergency is 697-6622. Uh, six, 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 two, two. Yeah, why did you say 69? Did I say 69? 6-6-7-7. 3-0-1. 3-0-1. 3-0-1. That's the area. Right. Can you repeat it? Yeah, go ahead. You butchered it. 3-0-1. 6-6-7-7. Okay. Six six two two. Thank you. In in any town hall, I encourage this because one of the things that comes up, whether you're talking to serious incident or uh, just, we had a playground that had to get shut down. I can't remember which neighborhood it was. I don't have the right personnel for that. But recently, one of the playgrounds got shut down about two days ago because some children pulled all of the rails out of the barrier on the second level of the playground. If you see children, and it doesn't have to be children, if you see something that's just not right and you don't want to get directly involved, I fully understand. But that number is why that's, that, that is our sheriff, right? That is how, it, if, even if we can't catch an individual, we are certainly not going to recognize the patterns of issues and where we can change our patrolling patterns if, if those things aren't reported. So please use that number. Cool. Um, so now we're at the question and answer portion of today. So if you could please, if you, if you do have questions, you can line up here and ask. I'll start with the first one, sir. I mean, going off of a lot of the incidents that have occurred on post over the years, not, not just the most recent one. The question has routinely come up. Can a, com can a commander bar a student from returning to the school on Fort Meade? even if they are a non-DOD student? And the short answer is yes. So the, for those that aren't familiar, one of, a bar is, uh, what's, well, sorry, the lawyer corrects me. The debarment, I don't understand why a bar is debarment, but the debarment is the action that says someone is not allowed to enter the installation. And uh, that, I, that goes for anybody. We, uh, there for, in the order for safety, security, and for good order and discipline of the installation, uh, we do have the ability to prevent someone from accessing the installation. Uh, and that is in place. So I, that does come up, because um, I'm sure someone's the next thought in their mind is, what about now? So yes, uh, for the child in question, there is an ongoing investigation, but a bar is in, a, 
the child has been restricted access to the installation uh, at this point in time that's in place and then also because it is a child that inherently did include a uh, guardian as well. Thank you, sir. Hi, um, my name is Catherine. I'm a clinical patient here. Is that Catherine with the K or is it? Uh, a K? Ribbon, but it's a K. Okay. <laughs> as my daughter says, Ks are, uh, C's are an abomination. We have K's and S's. Why do we need them? Okay, okay yeah. cool. Um, <laughs> so um, my question is kind of for the installation in the school system. I'm not sure what's me say. <laughs> Um, I'm um, in the school year there. Um, I'm also a military family. Um, I have been retired with the for a That's why we chose to come back here after being stationed here. My son went to Christian Hill for a couple years, and then we did not get to do that. So like, we were working all the way. Um, I want to know not about consequences for the child, because I know that's being dealt with. My question is more about what can we do to support our kids more before these incidents happen, right? Because it's not even about MacArthur. MacArthur is just where it happened, right? Incidents like this are happening all across our country. I come from Canada, so like this is totally foreign to me, right? I've lived in four countries now, being a military family, right? We've all lived in lots of countries. But this is the only awesome country where this keeps happening, right? And we're so, I'm so grateful to that teacher that it didn't go farther. Because when I read that article, I didn't sleep for days because my thought was, oh my God, I was literally within walking distance with my camera babies and their siblings were at that school and it could have been so much worse. Thank God it wasn't. Um, but why? Why did it happen? Why did this child, right? 12 years old, I think this kid was. They're just a child. Why? Why did this child feel the need to bring a weapon to school? I don't know this kid. I have no idea what happened. I can only surmise that this child didn't really want to hurt someone because they didn't. But why did they do it? How was this child bullied? Because when I read these stories of the incidents across the country, um, Sandy Hook, Parkland, Columbine, all of them, usually there has been instances of bullying, right? I mean, my son is one of those kids that faced astronomical bullying in middle school. Um, thankfully, he didn't do something bad, but, but why? Why did this child do this? So what can we, as our Fort Meade community, and as our school system do, what programs can we put in place to better support these kids through the early years, right? Right through our kinder babies, all the way up. We have our unity days, which are awesome. I love our unity days. My kids love their unity days, but that's four times a year. Actually, I don't know what a unity day is. Um, I'm going to, Dr. Kennedy's going to answer that later. Oh, no, sorry. And I'll go ahead. I want you, I want you. So, um, girls, you're going to have to help me out for so this. Like, oh. So a unity day is a day that specifically targets equity to make sure that our schools are showing equity, that our classrooms are showing equity, that we're showing a quality learning environment, not just for us and our faculty, but also for our children. We teach equity, inclusion, we teach them about bias. Let me tell you, there's nothing better than when I'm doing examples and lessons with my kids and a five-year-old screams out, Miss Moore, that is bias and that's wrong. And so we're teaching them right from the earliest grades, but we do have those lessons for him a year. And of course, we have amazing teachers in our county, and we incorporate these things throughout the year, but these are like targeted days and lessons. We need to do more of that. So I have the, I have, as a parent and as a military leader, I do have an answer, but definitely. That's what I'm saying, like, and, and maybe there's no answer tonight, but what can you do as a team to do more of this so that as the kids grow, we just have a more inclusive community so that they don't get to that point where uh, they're bringing weapons to school? I so appreciate your question. Um, one of the things that is a system that, that we recognize is like the, the need for, for social emotional support. Um, for each of our uh, levels, uh, like flex and advisory were sort of like mandated at, at, at schools. 
uh, for that uh, at the elementary and middle school level. I know second step in the, at the high school they the social emotional programming. So that was something that was put in place. Uh, obviously, we need to do. We, we have to continue to do more, right? So you know, just to there has to be more of a conversation between you know the school system, the base, the school system as a whole. But here are some things that 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 we thought about, but we got to do more. So I, just, I, I do want to be honest about that. Um, you know, the bully initiative that you talked about, a superintendent, you know, we had a conversation in a, in a town hall on Monday night about that. Um, and that's something that, you know, as a system, we're going to continue to, to do it in the land trust. Um, next year, we are going to be starting an alternative middle school in the, in the new cluster. And alternative is not that, right? Alternative is just that, right? Different. I, I started in Charlotte Mecklenburg at an alternative school. And there are a lot of kids that do well there. Ms. Bass was a principal open there in at an alternative school. So there's going to be, there's going to be schools there so that students, if they are, um, having some issues and need more support, we're going to be supporting them there. Um, I, I talked a little bit about the, the mentors, right, that we're going to be bringing in. Uh, these are individuals that have, um, that have worked in other urban uh, environments, and, and they're going to be uh, there also to support students as needed. I know Mr. Whiting and Dr. Durr have uh, mentors that they bring from the neighborhood uh, and to the school. Uh, those, are, those are programs that are going to continue to, to, to do. Um, you know, those are just sort of five or six things, but I think, you know, as a system we're paying, we're going to be um, having more counselors, right, that are going to be added to our budget for next year for, for school, right? So those are about six things that, that I know we're doing. Um, but in essence to your problem, in essence to the answer, like we are going to be thinking about coming up with a, a comprehensive, like, program and initiative that we can do. These are six things, but we need to, we need to come up with something. And families too. We need, we need any support. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to just add to that as well. Um, I, I'm thinking the whole social and emotional thing and, and you know what you brought up with the Unity Days, which is wonderful. We need to change our thinking from Unity Day being one four days out of the year or whatever it happens to be, I'm not sure, to every day embedded all day long rather than segregated out, right? So, yeah, I do want to add too for the Unity Days, and, and I'd love to hear your voice. That's why I asked that because they are four things that that our equity office, what teachers come up with. But one of the things that they they are doing too is is exactly that. Uh, at I know at, at some of the principal meetings and, and during the conversations, uh, it's not just that day. It's not just right. that that professional development. It's you know what is the, you know it, it's talking about embedding it into your everyday lessons. So that's exactly what they're doing. Uh, there's follow-up conversations. I know in going through some of the, the, the equity days that I go to, professors like teachers talk about how they're doing some of their own partnerships uh, with kids, and, and they come back with examples and they share with each other. Um, we got to continue to do that, but those are things that we're going to be studying. So if you talk about, um, I was going to say, I love Canadians. I, I'm not sure that's actually true. But, uh, America Junior is a great place to be. Uh, so it's it's one of those that you, you brought up. We know that gun culture is absolutely an undercurrent part of America. It is part of American history. It truly is a fiber of how this nation came to exist. And so therefore, America is, out of all of the uh, considered developed first world nations, it's the only one that has that unique of a situation. But if you follow any of the international news, France is having school shootings. The United Kingdom, Sweden is having school shootings. It somehow, the, in the global environment today, it, just as you pointed out, I don't know that it... Chad, did you step on my first? Nope. Always blame Chad. ABC. Uh, but it's one of those things that I don't know that situation has changed because middle school was always a nightmare. It was a junior high for me too, but, and my junior high was in a K through eight school. So even then we weren't really junior high, we were just at the far end of the hallway. But middle school has always been a nightmare of an age. Uh, what I think that I have seen as a leader, and we've had discussions amongst senior leaders, 
when we get new recruits into, and I'll talk Army specifically, you, we get new recruits into the Army, we have to teach them how to have a relationship. We have 18, 19, 20-year-olds plus who do not know how to engage a human being and actually just converse to communicate. We have people who don't know how to live together and not end up in a fistfight because something has happened over the course of 20 years with, I, you know, I'll blame technology because what else has changed? A lot has happened in 20 years. Regardless of the reason, the fact is that as children are growing, they do not know how to engage. So think about the terrible twos. Why were two-year-olds bad? Because you had a child who was starting to see the world and they couldn't communicate what it is that bothered them. They knew that this is empty and I want it to be refilled, but they can't say, will you please get me another glass of water? So what do they do? They throw it in frustration because they're not able to communicate. Now we see this in 20 year olds, it's not just in two year olds. They don't know how to communicate. Despite how much time we spend posting, uh, it is not the same thing as engagement. And I think that is, I truly believe that that is part of it. Now this is just a Michael Sack perspective of seeing the world and how we act as leaders. But I really believe that is a big part, is people aren't learning how to talk. And so when you talk bullying, as we know, there, there are some people that are true bullies, right? Uh, history is, has enough true evil people. But that number is really slim in the grand scheme of things. But the number of people who cause challenges and obstacles for others, that number is a lot higher. So how do we get after the ability to communicate where bullying doesn't even need to take place because we are able to say what it is we feel and learn to accept each other? They don't have to like each It's like family. You don't have to like each other. Uh, but you do have to work together and live together. So uh, I hadn't heard of the end of the day, and that probably could... As, as I said, we came back and now she's a senior in high school, so all she cares about is graduation and keeping me off her back about grades. And so the dynamic has shifted, but uh, I am excited and we'll look for opportunities. The other piece that uh, Partners in Education is a big program that I'm starting to reinvigorate and I've got Meredith on board to help me with it. it I saw it in Hawaii. And that's the first time I came across it when I was stationed at the Schofield Barracks. Uh, I'm curious, to, just to, anybody who's ever been in any forum with me knows I love the show of hands things, but is there anyone who's heard of a partners in education, especially military, that Fran, you don't count? I told you to win. Okay, and so you saw the previous duty station? In Hawaii. Uh, okay, anybody that wasn't in Hawaii? Because I really don't know if there are other bases that do it. Riley did and um, not military. My son is, but I'm in South Alabama. <laughs> okay. You follow? Like that's the only South Alabama. Well, a little further, Hot Beach is the shores of Alabama. Okay. You follow is a small town. One of my best friends is from there. And, uh, he hated when we sang way down the island the Chattahoochee. <laughs> but it literally was in his backyard. But um, so. The Partners in Education program is a DOD type program, but it's ultimately where we get units partnered with schools. And the idea is to help build some of those relations, and there's so many benefits that come out of that on, on both sides, for the military and for the schools itself. It went away from Fort Meade, in part because of the uniqueness of this base and how hard it is. There's no one person in charge of everybody on this installation because there's so many different organizations. Uh, but it's one that I frequently hear from other people and units, commanders and individuals that they would love to see because we all have an interest in making our schools better. So if you hear Partners in Education, uh, or PIE, I try not to use the acronym, uh, but that's one of those that we will be looking for individuals very shortly to help us get that program running and to create relationships. Uh, I already have, uh, I didn't get permission to, to use her name, but there is already a leader in the National Security Agency who reached out to me and said, I want to put someone in knee high to do cybersecurity. Right? Cybersecurity is a threat to everyone, and we need to make more children aware, and I want to see what we can do for after-school programs or for in-school clubs, lunchtime meetings 
where we can put someone there. There are senior leaders who absolutely want to make this happen, and I'm excited about it. And, and that's part of what we get. We model that behavior of just communicating. Thank you. Nikki G, uh, I did pull quite a few questions, some of which you've already answered, yeah, uh, okay. on the Facebook posts. Mm -hmm. um, but one of them that I am presenting for committee members who could be here tonight is a question about school violence before, in the sense that violence isn't contained in just the school. Um, a lot of us do live in the surrounding communities where our kids do walk to and from school. Um, we've had several instances of people bringing up in the last couple of weeks where that violence follows their students whole. And either that's where that violence is committed and it carried on into the schools, carried back into the school, or the threats are made at home and carried out on campus, uh, whether it's the elementary schools, middle schools, or high schools. So this is a question from the community, is what should the parent be doing in a situation where the violence is taking place, or the threats, um, or the violence even starts or is continued outside of the school, um, but both students are at the school together, and what's, or, uh, what response should the parent expect from the school, and who should they be contacting um, to kind of the continuation of preventing that violence from either following them home or following them to the school? Great question. Uh as a former principal uh, like that, I remember that vividly. and I'll talk today too, but that, a lot of the problems that you, you, you just, you know, just stated that, a lot of the problems that happen, right, with, with some of the violence obviously happens outside of school and then, and then comes to school. As a, as a principal, right, or as a school leader, and even as a teacher, your hope is that you get a heads up before, before you know, uh, everything happens in the school. Um, so my advice would be, and, and this is what has, you know, what has occurred, right? If something does happen outside of school, then the parents call 911, right? Because what's going to end up happening is that once that happens, then whatever, whether it's Western District, um, you know, or whatever the situation is, will then alert, uh, you know, the, the school resource officer. They'll either go to their their boss or their lieutenant or uh, but it's just to the SROs. Um, and what happens in many times, and it happened over, you know, a couple of weeks ago uh, at, for a situation, is that that would then get alerted to our uh, supervisor security door bed, um, and, it, and it gets alerted to the principal, and they're able to intercept. Um, many times, right, you call the parent, or, and, you know, once we, if we know about it before the school day, then we can call the parents of those individuals and have them bring them to school, right? And then we have to triage the situation and sort of go from there. Uh, we are getting more involved in like community um, uh, conversations um, and Dr. Sean Ashworth is someone that works in our safe and orderly offices and we have community individuals that know how to do the, the, the mediations and the resolutions and those are things that we're, that we're getting into also. But you know, those are the hard ones to, those are the hardest ones to do right, right there. Um, but again, if parents call 911. There's many times that afterwards, that, that parents they don't, right? So I'm glad you asked that question. But they call call 911 is the preference. Uh, second call the school. The 911 is the preference, so that they can get that going to their to their resource officers. And I believe that one 800 MPB safe is the number that you can call. Yeah. 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 I don't want anyone to get upset with me because it's not an emergency, and I feel like it is. Uh, that that is part of it. That's I mean. that would be for, I say nine one one because most individuals that's that's the easiest way to call. Yeah. So with that, with us being on base, should they be contacting nine one one or should they be contacting EMTs? Yes. Okay. So the six two two call base. If, it, if it's not a physical altercation where people are being harmed, this is yeah. With, uh, and just to repeat for the yeah. for the camera for the recording, the question was asking if it's on base, should it be nine one one? And the answer is, ultimately, if there's a immediate you know concern for security, yes. Uh, but also the base MP desk is one that you can call the three zero one six seven seven six six two two to report that as well. And I, I'd like to build on that. This, I thought this is where your question was going to go. It went to the physical threat. Uh, but the other piece is the, the emotional. 
And I think it's it's really easy to be too dismissive of the emotional impact that can occur as a result of the threat too. And so that I would encourage you, whether it's you as individuals, as parents, uh, for your children, whatever the case is, to be on the lookout for that too. Uh, military families do have the unique aspect that they can reach out to family advocacy. Uh, the FAB Family Advocacy Program, and Ms. Flowers is going to kill me because I can't think of her number for their office off the top of my head. But if you Google FAP Fort Me, you will find that information. Uh, but there are a lot, uh, it is not a counseling service, it is a education service for families and how we can how we can work together and signs to look out for. There, there is, but they are clinical, so licensed clinical social, LCSW, licensed clinical social workers. I did get the acronym right. Uh, but they are, they are social workers, right? So that's one of those outlets that we have. Kimbro has uh, social workers as well that fall into that space. is is not a behavioral health type appointment, but fits in with the family dynamic. The other thing that is unique uh, that hopefully everybody here who at least has a child in middle or high school knows is that the military family life counselors or the MPLEX. Uh, our two middle schools and our high school have MPLEX and those are licensed counselors. They do not work for, they're not government federal civilians, they are contracted. Uh, which gives them great placement and access. It gives them some flexibility that a Kimbro Medical Center behavioral health uh, employee cannot do, but it makes them accessible in the schools too. And they're there for the military families, whether it's the parent or the child, that's why they're in the school. And I can't remember the name of the carpet off the top of my head. But she will also kill me because we. What is it? Lauren Hill. Yes. Lauren, Lauren Hill. Thank you. I say uh, we text back and forth sometimes because she really got a kick out of our dogs chasing down the principal uh, when they had the military appreciation day. That's a great day. She even sent me videos of it yeah. too. Uh, but Lauren is, if you are MacArthur specific, since that's the school that we discussed today. Uh, Lauren is there for your children, but she's also there for the parents. And so that is another resource that you can reach out to. Sir, the uh, number for FAP is 301-677-4118. And uh, MFLEX in general are, are also now stationed over at Coon Hall. We, we have them permanently at, the, at, at Coon Hall. Right, for the installation writ wide, the Coon Hall Education and Resiliency Center that we cut the ribbon on that building on the in November is on Llewellyn Avenue. Uh, if you've seen that, the Joseph Kuhn, K-U-H-N Hall, it's big on the building. You'll see it now near the public affairs office. But the Coon Hall has two MPLEX that are on every day, Monday through Friday, we've got one there in those spaces that's available for just walk-in discussions. Okay. Next question from whereabouts in Alabama again? Alabama. Oh, okay. okay. I'm Dean Tomley. I am the family care plan for my grandson who attends MacArthur Middle School. My son is stationed here at Fort Um, I come from Baldwin County Schools in Alabama. We were one of the first schools our superintendent provides everybody and installed SROs. And our parents had a fit, they thought, you know, but our ball and town shirt stepped up and said, I'll pay this SRO, we're going to put them in the schools. Now everybody thinks he's doing the right thing. Our superintendent also divided everybody and put metal detectors in the schools. There again, he took the heat and he said, I don't care, we're going to have everybody come through metal detectors. It's expensive, I understand that, that's what I heard from someone in the administration at MacArthur. The one thing that we do have at Baldwin County, and I went to pick my grandchild up the other day for a doctor's appointment, that we do not have at MacArthur School, which I was kind of disappointed, 
It's when I went to the front door to get into the school, you push a button <coughs> and they wanted to know what I was there for. And I said, I'm here to pick up my grandson for a doctor's appointment. And they said, okay, come on in. At Baldwin County, when you approach the front door to get in, you push the buzzer and they want to know why you are there and you identify yourself. You also have to present a photo ID that has to match you before they ever unlock the door for you to get inside the school. They have a camera there. I don't know how expensive the cameras are, but it can be too expensive to just everybody has a ring doorbell that they see that's there when the UPS <coughs> So I certainly think after all the school shootings that we've had and people get inside the school, I know this is the base, but we have people coming in and out and we don't know what people's mistake is on day to day. I do have one other question for you. Sure. If there is an active shooter in MacArthur School, and I understand you have it, are you allowed to enter the school or do you have to wait for the police department? It's a good question. So, uh, but if you can come to a mic. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. And we do have the lawyer to keep us in line, make sure we're not crossing jurisdictional issues. <laughs> so, uh, that's a good question. Um, so, because of the jurisdictional issues, um, we will be in route at the same time at a lot of time. So, the notification uh, will most likely get to us and them at the same time. And uh, we will arrive generally at the same time and be in support of the uh, time. Is that right? Yes. Right. Then you cannot enter the building. Okay. We can't. So it's going to be a situation just like in Texas. You're going to be standing out there with your hands tied and the active. No, no, no. We, can. we can't. We can, man. We can enter the building. We can. Okay. 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 So whoever gets there first is going in is what he said there. Yeah. Okay. To, to your, uh, that's fine, Mike. Thank you. Uh, to your question, ma'am, right, that's, there are certain things that they're so impactful that that's what we end up referring to, uh, that we refer to when we think of what could happen next. And I'll tell you, that that is definitely, first and foremost, on my mind, not just a school shooting in Texas, but any situation where, uh, I so I was stationed at West Point and I was working with the Force Protection Office in Garrison while I was stationed there. That was 07 to 10. We did active shooter drills in 2007 to 10 annually at the West Point schools, but we did it with the Joint Terrorism Task Force of uh, New York City because the FBI needed to do that. It was easier for them to coordinate sometimes on a military installation. And so uh, it, it was something that we could take advantage of that they had to do, and therefore we got that. Uh, so when that happened in Texas, my first thought was, well, don't all schools do this? Because I had a misconstrued frame of reference. And, and since coming here and that question came up, uh, that's one of the things that we have actually discussed integrating into our base defense exercise plan is to do. Now, as soon as you say an active shooter drill, that also carries all sorts of nuances. And so while we know, we have recognized the need that we do need to exercise the jurisdictional issues with the Anne Arundel County Police Department, us and, uh, as the Fort Meade Director of Emergency Services at the same time. But we also have to, have to be cognitive. We want to get value out of it, but we don't want to scare all the children and anybody else to think that there's a situation where we can't. So how we do that, we are spending a lot more time than we normally would on planning and exercise just because we want to make sure it doesn't get misconstrued during that situation. Right, I just want to make sure, I mean, because I know the MPs are here. Yep, the microphone. That the MPs are here. Yeah. And if there's a first on scene, I don't want them standing outside because of some paperwork that says they cannot enter the school. Right, they can enter the school, but why we need to exercise it too is if they respond to a situation that they believed was an active shooter. Because I, I spent four hours in an x-ray room at Bethesda the last time I was here because uh, someone heard a bang and they locked down all of Bethesda. And 
I, I can also imagine that if there's a scenario like that and our MPs come storming through a building, when there isn't an actual threat, it was just a perceived threat, then there's also a problem there too. And so that, that's why we need to actually actually have the plan in writing and exercise it, uh, which is what we're doing. That it, the goal is within the next year we have done the, ex we've actually run through reps and sets. As I, certainly, I mean, they have it in Baller County and Mobile County every day. Students call and say, and they have to shut down the school. They got storm this school, but they shut down the schools. And, you know, but I just want to make sure that there's no dotted eye right. or cost Nobody's to. waiting while children are putting greater risk. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. No, thank you, President. Thank you. And thank you for sharing the other, uh, sorry, TTPs. I don't know what normal people call them. That's okay. I tactical. Tactical. Take like this. I know what it is. TTP is. Ma'am? Good evening. Uh, I really don't use the mic either. Um, my name is Tommy. Camera Boy, I am the camp. The, the camera. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I am a resident of Fort Meade, um, a parent of two students at MacArthur, and a Meade Cluster employee. Now, my question is when there are students that attend some of the schools, um, and they have parents who are unable to pass the background check to get on base, why are they still allowed to attend the school um, if, if their adult is unable to pass and come get them if there's an issue? And this is where we look at each other to see who wants to answer that question. <laughs> So, so I will, what, well, what I will say is that I recognize the concern, and uh, that's actually a question I haven't dug into personally to see the numbers. I know that there are some, right? I don't know if that sum is one, or if that sum is a dozen, a hundred, I, I don't know. Uh, I recognize that can be a concern. But there are other guardians, and so really, I believe that part of the program and the intent is the child needs to get an education. And so as long as there is a guardian that can bring the child on post, we don't need to allow the parents on post. Just because the parent is an offender does not mean the child is. And so in order not to place the child at risk for something that they can't be held accountable for, does it increase a potential risk factor? Certainly, because we have all sorts of children that come from different broken homes and their increased risk factors. And I think that goes back to what Catherine brought up too, is seeing how the children engage on each other. And uh, that's where I would like to put my focus rather than kicking children off. The other challenge we have with this cluster is because we do have two middle schools, one high school. So if they're not going to the Mead cluster, they're probably not going to a school because uh, where they're able to get. But I've, also leave that to the yeah. I, I don't have the numbers right so I can't it's hard it's hard for me to answer the question because I, I don't have the numbers. I do know of I do know of students that are going to the middle school because of that very scenario. Right. So because uh, I've had a conversation with the principal at the middle school and the principal in the carpet for that. But I do know of at least one student that's at the carpet who, who can't uh, can't get there like I've had a conversations with the administration about like what to do if something happened. Like, we did have that conversation. Um, so I mean we can dig into it a little bit, especially if Colonel South feels like it's a safety issue. Um, but for many students in that scenario they do go to new things. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening team, my name is uh, Jeremiah Ross. Um, just a couple of thoughts and uh, question. Uh, first, Colonel, you mentioned trust is critical to this relationship. I'll tell you that uh, my trust in the garrison and the carpet middle is so low right now that uh, when my wife and I leave for work in the morning, we hug our son and we say a prayer for his safety. So I'm going to give you two vignettes. Um, not asking for action because we have filed the appropriate uh, complaints through the process, but the vignettes lead to my ultimate question. Okay, So my son broke his arm at Carpenter Middle School. During the day, 
There was a temporary nurse on duty. His arm was visibly broken. It wasn't just a minor thing. You can see the indentions in his arm. We filed the x-rays with the complaint. The nurse did not reach out to us. My son told the nurse that, my mother, that his mother is a teacher at the other school on base, called the front office and opened a hold of her. The PE coach, his English teacher, recognized his arm was broken. The nurse didn't do anything. She gave him a brown paper towel and sent him back to class. Two <coughs> emergency room visits later, we were able to get his arm fixed. The second one finally had some resolution today. He's been trying to get his schedule changed since September, has gone through three counselors in the Carpenter Middle School. Each one of them has said they have addressed his schedule change request and would make it happen. Those three counselors have since moved on and nothing was changed. It took me going into the office yesterday and today to get resolution. I had to, if it, Ms. Moore is a safe. Ms. Kim Moore in the front office is an amazing lady. She helped me navigate the process, but I told her I'm ready to escalate this through the chain of command all the way to the superintendent. And what this is boiling down to is personnel. So my question is, what is the county doing to recruit and retain talented folks to help take care of our students in the county? And I'm not expecting an answer right now, because this is, this is a bigger problem, right? You know, I think we, my personal opinion, we have to stop talking about it's because of COVID, it's because of society. What is the county doing to be proactive to recruit and retain the talent that we need in our schools to take care and educate our kids? Let me answer as far as yeah, as far as the, the retaining, um, I'm, you know, I, the, the staffing is an issue, right? And I know that you said as far as like like not blaming on, on COVID, and I hear what you're saying, but that that is a that's an that is an issue, right? That's an that's an issue in our county. That's a, that's an issue as well as our state. Um, I will say that one of the things that our superintendent has done is to uh, make sure that teachers steps right and make sure that their their cola and make sure that their their pay is increased. Um, and he's done that to the detriment of of, of, of not asking for more staff uh, or more teachers. Um, because one of the things that he's all, always communicated and he's communicated at town and across is that. We do lose some of our, our best and brightest to Montgomery, to Highwood, and et cetera. So one of the things that he's committed to doing is, is putting the pay of teachers and putting the pay of bus drivers and putting the pay of custodians at least the average of, you know, of a Montgomery County, of a, of a Highwood County. So those are like just, just to me, like important major steps that he's doing, uh, you know, to, to make, you know, to make pay at least. Uh, as far as uh, like the our human resources, like we just like other folks are like aggressively doing staffing fairs. We're aggressively going to um, different like countries and states, right? Just to, to just to do some job fairs for our, for our students, for our teachers that are in the special education realm. Uh, I believe there's like a two thousand dollar bonus that's going to be provided to to those teachers, right? Just to, as sort of like sign-in bonuses. Um, so those are just some of the creative things that I can think of. I could, you know, probably have to take some down for that question and come back with some more specifics. But, you know, try to get teachers to at least equal pay for our surrounding county, paying special ed teachers a couple of thousand dollars in short for assigning bonuses, um, you know, are, are things that we're trying to do to, uh, to make sure that all of our employees, teachers, bus drivers, custodians or something, because he, he will say, right, you know, we are, you know, in one of the more wealthier counties in the, the state of Maryland, but we're paying like at the bottom. So that's his commitment. I know he's communicated that to the county executive. I know that he communicates that to the to our, our school board, um, and and that's part of like the budget that's going to be coming from the I appreciate that, sir. It's something that I offer you to consider. Is you know, it's not always about the money. Yes, we all want more money, but uh, I'm friends with a lot of teachers here in Fort Meade. Quality of life for those teachers is a big factor in whether they're going to stay or go. Agreed. Thank you. And to, to build on that, the two things I wanted to add, one, you kind of took away from me, but it's the quality of life. Uh, Principal Whiting and I talked about this too with the, uh, you call it vice principal or assistant? Assistant. With the assistant principals, uh, but it's, it's the idea of turnover. Uh, he is working hard just because the problem is even if you had, if, you have an office of 20 people uh, 
and they keep changing every year, it's still not building the trust that they need amongst each other. So when the teachers are stressed that they have the support group that they can even talk to, or that the students trust because they identify something wrong and they'll communicate it and that information gets shared. So he's taking, we've talked about some of these initiatives are really about what can we do also to keep consistency amongst the staff and faculty. Uh, because we got it, you've got to care about where you are. And, uh, and when you care, then that's when things don't get swept under the rug. Or if an individual is doing it, they're held accountable for you. The second half of that is the accountability piece. And obviously, we can't control the accountability of, of the school nurse or something like that. But Ms. McCandless, that is part, she is your school advocate. And so she has routine engagements with all of the principals that are in the Mead cluster. And then she has connections with Dr. Kennedy as they meet cluster, not just the seven schools on the base. Uh, and I have engagements with Dr. Bedell or the county. So we, we are your garrison advocates, uh, not just for the 10,000 family members that live on the base, but for anyone assigned, the 16,000 service members assigned here, DOD civilians, if there is a military DOD connection with Fort Meade and local schools, you can also use us. We, I like to say we don't have, um, we, we don't have uh, capability. We, we can't make it happen, but we have leverage and influence. And so we do have the ability to affect change even if we can't make it. Just add uh, just uh, um, something else. Colonel Zapp talked about like the current teachers, and I want to make sure I had the pleasure of talking to to many of the MacArthur teachers, um, and, and still do. So, keeping teachers is important, right? You know, so that is something along with trying to get teachers. Keeping teachers are important, and part of what we're doing as a central office is is like incentives and, and thinking about like how do we do that. Uh, myself, I met yesterday with our director of senior staffing. Uh, along with uh, another individual here, uh, to talk about that very important stuff. And so, you know, trying to, as I communicated, trying to, get, you know, new staff is important. But as Colonel Sam said, retaining and keeping people is something that we are very keen to do. I'm going to turn the office yesterday, as a matter of fact, you and your wife. I, I just want to say, I sat in the seat of Director of Staffing and Recruitment for. 10 years in this county. For 10 years, I watched college students dwindle down that did not want to teach. So we are in a battle with other occupations long before COVID that allowed people to work from home. I found that we can't teach from home because I need the relationship. So we have worked on this. This is a 10 year project. And now like, I went in 203, I was Queen Anne County Director of HR. So it's just not our county that cannot get people who want to do education, whether they want to be front office administrators or teachers. But I, I want to tell you, we have heard parents, we have heard people at town hall, we know there's a shortage. So we have to then develop within communities to develop people who want to be passionate enough to come and do this and build really not on community, but you gotta build curriculum. If you're not dedicated, constant turnover does not let you complete a program. A principal like Mr. Whiting has to have people who wanna come, please give me five years. That's what I was saying at recruitment phase. Please, five years, I can build a program. You can come to the community. We are in constant, constant competition. All of the big five. They all on one hand for teachers coming and going. So I want to let you know this has not fell on deaf ears, and you've been echoed since 2003. I've heard the concern. Another question: It's been going on since 2003, and now we're in 23. Mm -hmm. When are we going to fix this for our children? You've got to get the personnel. I don't. I don't know if the military has a recruitment problem that colleges have. Oh, okay. Good, I need a little validation. Yeah, no, I, I didn't know that. I mean, I had no idea. But for us, colleges have, well, the universities have colleges that have teacher ed programs. They are folding. They, they are folding. So consequently, we don't even have the training program. 
So what we have done is that people who have a degree in this state, you can be a conditional teacher so long as you have the degree in something related. So let's say you are health sciences, you can get the degree. Then you have to come in to a resident teacher program. We have that, we have a great one. And then you get 18 credits towards your degree and then four more for student teaching, which you get the credit for the teaching until you complete it. So then here at Fort Meade, since I was here in 1980 to 88, then my teachers leave. They came, we educated them, they, and your orders turned over January and June. Back then, I don't know now, um, Colonel Sand, but it, it is then a problem. So even in 1980, we couldn't keep them in this particular community because orders turned over. So if a husband left or a wife left, so went my teacher. So I, I just want to know, we are fighting, probably worldwide, because as Dr. Kennedy said, we're traveling the world looking for teachers. Foreign countries have stopped their teachers from leaving. Because if I, if, I, if I take them from Spain to teach Spanish in our language, I can't go to China, but if we go someplace that they're doing Mandarin, their boards of education is not gonna let them out of the country. And then if we go to other countries, we're in the same way, we don't wanna sponsor people. So that's costly. So consequently, we are going to continue to turn. The most innovative program is a resident teacher. Somebody coming, a career changer that did 30 years or 20 years or whatever has been in something else and then come and want to devote the rest of their life, working life, to, to children. So it's a bleak picture. And I would say my mother is an educator, my sister is an educator. <laughs> Uh, my mother ended up as a special administrator or administrator for special education, and what she described, it, I can't speak for worldwide because I haven't looked into that, uh, but it is definitely across the country. And so it's kind of like we hear about music programs closing in colleges. You go, well, that's fine. Who really needs music education? Uh, but when you see that happening with educators, uh, it, it is scary. And so. What I would say, what I would ask, because now I'm wondering, I know for the military, we actively go to colleges as well to recruit. Is, is there a standing program for like Bowie State, Towson, et cetera, the, the county or something? Yeah, the, the recruitment is done at colleges and universities. So we'll, I mean, we're going we're gonna to keep doing some of the things we talked about, like recruiting, financing, something. Uh, I've already talked to some of the McCarthy teachers and they know that, like, you know, I'm gonna have a conversation with, with them about potential, uh, like, virtual options. How can we, how can we sort of, like, marry some things together? So we're gonna, like, it's on us to be creative, too, right, as far as how to do that. Thanks for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. How are you? I'm good, yeah. Good. You can bring it down. We had like your college question. You brought up saying you didn't answer one of my questions about the alternative schools. I'm glad to hear it. Unfortunately, my daughter, this is her last year, so it doesn't really help us too much. But I've spoke to the educational, the board of education. I've spoke to not this year, but the school director. Right? Last year, it was Miss Duda. Wasn't a big fan. I wasn't getting the answers for the help that I did. My child has been bullied. She has been assaulted. She has been sexually assaulted. And the county police did not do their job. I was very upset. Um, you said, as far as behavior, what did you call it? Um, referrals. For this, for many years, or even for the children next year, how many strikes are they supposed to have for being kicked out? What about the safety? I, like, I have seen the same repeaters that have not been suspended, have not been kicked out. I am very disappointed. I have literally feared for my daughter's life. I have had to, on my own personal funds, on board me, please. Are you working? Because no, I'm not calling my daughter. I'm sorry. They mm -hmm. were in the school watching my daughter get insulted. They didn't jump in, they didn't protect her. It took two teachers a few minutes later. It was on Instagram that day. 
She was repeatedly bullied after that. She's still getting bullied. I brought videos. I did my own investigation. As far as the sexual assault, this kid act did not reach out to me until the end of the school year. It's the end of the school year. I reached out to her at the first moment. How many times do these repeaters have, and they're still in school? Mm. My name? You have three strikes. You're suspended. You're this. You're kicked out. I reached out to the Board of Education. They didn't do nothing. They gave me the recommendation. You want to homeschool your child. <coughs> you want to do this. That's not fair to my child. She's a straight A student. She's in the average program. She does dance. She does all types of things. When you're at oh, at home school, you don't get those programs. That's not fair. Why does my child have to suffer? Because this child that's probably a CE student gets the same school. That is a problem. I mean, that's not fair. So um, after, like after you talk about talk to you, if I could, so, so I can get some more information about what you're talking about. Like specifically, um, like for, I mean, general, generally, I mean, obviously, the, the safety I have videos, of I, I documents. Know, the safety of all of our students is it's something not that okay. I know. But, uh, the safety of all of our students is something that we need to make sure. So if it's okay, like that, I want to get some. I have a problem. I have, you know, even you know, in my other questions, actually, I work on board meetings. Whenever there's a situation that happens on the court, you get robocalls, calls, emails, everything. Even an essay, whatever. I get an email from this. No, we did not thank the board, we did not shoot up the school. We didn't get nothing. The schools, we got what? So, heard the news and the little email. It happened at 2 45. We didn't get an email until what, 4 40, 4 30? Five are you kidding? Like, this is how I feel like parents are getting on the news. How I'm going to lose my dog and go crazy because my dog could be even when she got attacked. My teacher actually told her, You shouldn't be texting or calling your mom. I was two seconds up the street. You're not going to tell my child she can't contact me if you're not protecting my child. Just that. Thank God the child did not shoot up the school. But I'm telling you now, where, how did it, Anne Arundel County not contact you guys at that time? Because whenever you guys get called, we get these robocalls calls with something emergency happening on for me. And I'm going to be that crazy person if y'all are not a part of it, not doing protecting my child. I'm going to have to break the law and go in that school and get my child. So it's not just our kids, our teacher safety. It's the parents, we're going to be the one punished because I'm being shit. I'm going to lose everything my kids are going to suffer because I am the only protector I feel like for my child. And that's not okay. But, so what I would ask you, because you, you asked, you said when there's an emergency, mm -hmm. why why do you think you get the robocall? Because I work on base, sir. Everything no, that I, happens on base, we get emergency calls. We get reported to I why do you get, say no, where I, I work I at, but... So I my get question is, calls, and this is the first situation that I did not. Why do you get a call for an emergency? Because I work on days. No. What is the purpose of the call? Stating there's an emergency on Fort Meade. For what purpose? If you don't think that was an emergency, I'd that, rather he's not at the school or not. I should know if there is a gun without a police officer attached to that gun. I should know that that happened. So the point, you the point of that I should have okay. had an emergency, but I should have been told within 30 minutes that something happened in that school, not at 5 o'clock. I'm sorry, we get told. Do you that want you me to answer or do you just want to keep talking? Okay. Okay, thank you. An emergency message goes out so people can react and prepare for the emergency to deal with it. Okay. At the time of the notification, the notification was that the gun was secured. So there wasn't an emergency. Now, did we have a dangerous situation? Absolutely. Could it have gone worse? Certainly. But by the time anything was discovered, it was already that immediate issue was resolved. So for as far as why something didn't go out immediately after, because let's put it in a framework where it by released an alerts message saying there is a gun on at MacArthur. 
it didn't matter if the next sentence of that message was, and it has been secured, everybody would immediately rush to MacArthur to bring their child home. But it wouldn't be for any end because there was no threat from that gun at the school. It doesn't mean there's not a problem, but the, the, there wasn't an emergency at that time. So that's because the staff asked me, and I'm, no, we're not releasing a message because there's no emergency to react to. Now, there's a situation to resolve, and there are plans that we need because there was a security threat that shouldn't have been there. But in a similar, if someone hits, if someone tries to uh, come onto post without an ID card, and we stop them, we have stopped them from coming onto post with an, without an ID card. The barrier goes up, they hit the barrier, hopefully they stop because I don't want them to damage my barriers. But there's no emergency because it has been resolved as it started. Uh, so we wouldn't send out a message to say, hey, someone tried to drive onto the post. There would be a follow-up as we do the investigation. So the second is why it took an hour and a half to get there. Uh, one of the things, and now, granted, remember, this is my first time as garrison commander, third time on the base. And I, while I've been on many military bases, I didn't know what to expect. Where I'm actually excited about how it worked is that at, uh, it was 2.59, I think is what they finally said, was the time that the teacher showed up and said, hey, we have something we want the SRO to look at. Three minutes after that, we got a phone call from the county. And so in my office, we had uh, Colonel Bremmett was there. I think we, well, either physically or we had on phone, public affairs, and Fran within about four minutes after that phone call. Initially, it was just myself and PAO. So the, the relationship is good in that they called and said, this happened. We don't even have the details yet because it was essentially two echelons above. I knew before Dr. Kennedy knew, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I don't know if you found out within three minutes, but because of how it was coordinated, the base found out quickly. And then the discussion, well, do we send our military police? Yes, because we need to have somebody on the ground to understand. And we want to confirm that there's no more threat. But do we want to notify? No, because we had a town hall scheduled for 5.30. And we knew that as part of that conversation that Anne Arundel County was already drafting the message. So it, it was a very deliberate process. Now, does that alleviate your concern? No. Because in the end, as a, as a parent, especially if your child's there, or not just, and we focused a lot on parents and students, but we have families that live outside of MacArthur Middle. They also, they don't have any children there. But also we're concerned. So there are still issues to address. But as far as your question, why didn't you get it? It's just that. Because there wasn't an emergency by the time anything was even known and it had been resolved. And therefore we used just regular messaging. Uh, maybe the second half of your question. Uh, I lost it. Uh, I don't know. Call me. But to get off of that, yes. in my previous experience with the um, if Lloyd, don't be in that situation. But if something does occur, and anyone was not doing their job, can I call for me to handle the situation or request yes. them to handle it instead of it? Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Kennedy's getting mad at me because I'm going to say wholeheartedly yes. But, um, and okay, so there is a joint jurisdiction. If you call, I want you to call us, right? Because that way we can be informed and know because there is a threat and I want to know about threats on this, on this installation, let alone outside of it. How we will react is initially we will coordinate with the county. Uh, and so that if, if you call, they would call up and say, hey, Colonel Bremen, we've got a parent concern, excuse me, uh, allegation of sexual assault and Therefore, his first call would be then to the Anne Arundel County Police Department to say, have, are you already tracking this and then what can we do? Uh, but as far as can you, yes, and I would like you to. Because we are here for that as well. But now, Dr. Kennedy. So, I was going to say before, in, in most cases, right, when something like happens, um, if, if it's a threat, right, then parents 
if the threat was with live, then the, the, the parents would receive it almost immediately. Uh, in this case, because the administration found out or, or found out, right, with the student not having the weapon, you know, on him, right? So that's why there was no lockdown, hence no, no threat at that time. So, you know, when he found, when the administration found out, they did call like central office, right? I would probably tell not three minutes, but between <laughs> five and 10 minutes and, and went directly to the school. And then, you know, determining what happened was the problem, right? So we had to tell staff this, right? And, but in order to tell staff this, we needed to know what was going on. And because there was no threat right at that time, there was no going into the lockdown situation. So that's, you know, you know, I have been in situations too where if there was something happening, yes, parents will get that. The school isn't in lockdown. Um, we are, we will let you know what's going on. In this case, because when uh, it, when the principal was found out, when the principal found out about the situation, the student did not have the weapon, then there was no threat at the time. And to, to the question, I know you're going to link up with her afterwards to yes. discuss details, uh, but for the good of the group, so if the same situation happens where they feel like they're not getting the support from the school, what's the next step within your structure? Um, myself, right? They, you know, if you if you call the regional office, then then they link with me, and I try to resolve it. How do we? So I know who you are. I've tried to Google you, your name and position without your name, and I don't know what search terms to use because I couldn't find it. So even if you, I'm, I can find that out. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but uh, even if you call the, the central office number. Right, and ask for the supervisor for MacArthur, they will direct you to okay. But I'll, you know, I'll, I'll get some right, right here because I love it. Superintendents, well, I think when we have these situations, that information also should be given. Us. Again, I haven't had an issue this well, I'm still single with you, but I haven't had a major issue this year. It was last year, me and that person. I was just told, write a letter to the board, do this, talk to Anna Rundle, handle this. Now, but you know that's my job, right? And and even when I was a principal, I had a boss that that you know did the same thing. And there are some issues that I I'm, I've dealt with and I'm dealing with, yeah. where I have to you know do the best to my ability to resolve it, and that's 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 what I do. Yeah. And also, um, that's what the school liaison is. I am your liaison, not just you, but any military family. I am your liaison between Fort Lee and the school system. So come to me. That's what I'm here for. See, I even tried to get the guidance counselor because he was vicious. He was. Can you check on him? Can you do this? Not a single time. Not a single mm -hmm. time? Yeah, we'll get the details too. Well, was, I, and Mike, if you can ask the I appreciate it. No, thank, thank you. you. Ma'am, I'm sorry. Yeah, Thank you. Good evening. My name is Vanessa Dodos Ricky. I am a parent of two MacArthur students. I want to do that, Jessica, as well. Um, I'm also the PTSA president for MacArthur Middle School. I'm also an associate professor of science education at Morgan State University. I'm also a former high school teacher. Um, and so I'm, I'm clear about the staffing issues uh, because as I sit in my teacher ed class working with my students, I see our numbers dwindling. Um, but one of the things that I want to ask, you talked a lot about partnerships between um, Fort Meade, Anne Arundel County Public Schools, the police department. Um, I know that parents can get involved with the PTSA, um, and if you slept on it after Monday and thought you wanted to run for an office for our local PTSA, please, by all means, talk to me after this event. But what are some other ways that parents can be involved with the school? Um, and with the school district. So I also had the opportunity to serve as the secondary D cluster rep on the CAC. So can you talk to us a little bit about how parents can be involved in school, um, uh, how their presence can really make a difference in what's happening inside of our schools? I'm going to let Principal Whiting talk about it from the principal's point of view. But I will say, when I was principal at Lee High School, we had over 300 member PTSA award winning. That's how we got the ID program. That's how we got Homeland Security, the first signature program. So you are correct. Parents and communities make a difference. So if you want to continue to get some strength, 
that's exactly how you, how you do it. We'll talk CAC in a second, but I just wanted to echo you. And I was, you know, as, you, as a PTSA president, and my plea is, is for people to join PTSA. Right? That is the biggest thing to do, strength in numbers. And um, yeah, I would like to applaud you, Dr. Dorisaviki, for what you've done as far as supporting MacArthur Middle School as a PTSA president. Um, and as you know, um, it can be difficult to get parents to turn out for the PTSA. Um, it can be difficult to get parents to get involved at the middle school level. It just seems like in my 10 years of experience as principal at MacArthur Middle School, it seems like PTSAs at the elementary uh, level are so huge, they're enormous. You know, parents are banging down the door to get involved with elementary schools. But when we get to the middle school, I don't know what happens, but it drops, you know. Um, I, I would love to get more parents involved. I know that um, there's a process in order to volunteer um, at specific schools as far as background checks and all of that. But contact the school. We'll do whatever we can to expedite that that uh, that process, that background process, and get you involved at MacArthur Middle School. Um, we'd love to see you. I don't know during cafeteria duty, um, um, shadowing your your student throughout the school day, um, supporting uh, teachers within the building with uh, things that they need accomplished uh, in the classroom, uh, so on and so forth. So. Uh, Let's forget about any sort of roadblocks in order to make that happen. Uh, contact the school, ask for Mr. Whitey, and we'll, we'll get it done. Just finally, um, and, you know, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, Chad a little bit, uh, because I think that as friends of me, we're going to be having one more event at the end of the year. We had a fabulous fall event, and I think this is hopefully one way we can help, you know, kick, kick off this event, right? Because I think that, to your point, we can talk CAC because that is important, but I'm selfish. I want to see how we can build up some new cluster parents and, and figure out what we can do from here. So that's where my mind is. The other thing that I would say is, is part of my initiative. So, so we have, we're getting the partners in education back up and running. Uh, it will happen. But there's also, a, I'm meeting, I think it's in two weeks, but with our Army Community Services volunteer coordinator and team because I think there is a larger opportunity. I know we we have people who want to volunteer that may not even have children, but they want to do something else with their time right. to be value added. Yeah. And so that's part of what we're looking at too. Okay. So be on, be on the lookout. The Fort Meade Facebook page is where, I hate the fact that that is our number one way of communicating because Facebook gets to mess with the algorithms and. Just because we put it most recent doesn't mean it's on top. Uh, but that is one of the ones that we will, uh, it, it is the simplest for us to be able to message because updating a website in Army bureaucracy issues uh, just makes things a little more challenging. Uh, but continue to look out for town halls and other events where we will advertise volunteer opportunities. And for any, if you are as president of PTSA or we have the president of the Parent Advisory Council, or any, that's part of what I'm gonna use Meredith and our volunteer coordinator, is to gather these lists, almost, bases, I, I don't think Fort Meade has it, bases had the babysitter list, right? You just go and say, hey, we do have that, right? Okay, it's been so long since I asked for one once you turn 14, um, the oldest could take care of them. But, right, you go to a, the Child Youth Services, and you say, hey, I want a list of all registered babysitters, so I know who to call. I want to do the same thing for our presidents, whatever you call the leader of those different types of councils we have. So when people are just saying, you know, I'm thinking about getting involved, here's a selection. Uh, please help because strength in numbers. Yes, ma'am. I know you waited patiently. Uh, I actually have a question that can send a little bit past the school violence itself. Um, as a resident of these courts, uh, Clark Road specifically, we actually called this out a couple of town halls ago um, for the destruction on our playground. So my question is actually centering around, since we have such a high population at me, or at Clark Road Middle specifically, um, of non DOD ID card holders, non-military people, what is the school as well as the garrison doing to keep them on school property only? Because um, I know 
we have specifically, there's myself and there's one other person here, who we have had serious issues with the middle schoolers themselves coming and hanging out in our park in our neighborhood, because we're right there. Um, uh, it, their, their path through the woods leads directly into our neighborhood. So it's like the hotspot of the damage, of the severe bullying, of the older kids threatening and misbehaving towards adults, towards younger kids. Uh, so what is the garrison doing um, to protect the residents who are not directly tied to the middle school? And the court at Morbolov, we have contacted the NFB several times and asked for an increased presence, and it's happened twice, and then two weeks later they're gone. So that presence happens. Right, it's not going to be perpetual it's, because it's a deterrence, but it can be a uh, random anti-terrorism okay. measures, right? They change mm -hmm. things up. It can certainly be part of that, that based on the matter. So, yes, if, if you've been making calls, now it, it's not a call for MP presence. It, it really, you know, it's troubleshooting. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever that specific incident is, issue, uh, then we can get them out there. The, the other change that we've done recently, and it's not implemented yet because we're still doing the legal review and such, uh, for those that military speeds, CCIR, Managed Critical Information Requirement, uh, every installation has, every commander has, these are the things I want people to notify me of. One of the shortcomings that we realize as a result of what happened when the gun was brought to school is that document doesn't exist. Uh, we got the call, and I'm grateful we did. That was an obvious one to notify the installation. But it, I know that I personally haven't communicated to anyone on this half of the table. I don't think my predecessors had to say, hey, here are the things that, as a commander of the installation that I care about, one of the things that we have added to that list is uh, unexplained absences of children in the school. And we don't mean someone didn't report to school, but they were in second period and they weren't in third. We've never said this is a concern for us because we've never communicated what our concern was. But that is one of the things that Fran specifically had on there when we reviewed the list last week for that reason, because there is a level of accountability. It's great the bus brings them here, but if they're here and then they spend six hours at the playground or anywhere else, uh, there is an elevated threat. It doesn't mean it's a danger, but there is an elevated level of risk that we need to know to be informed and make this answer. So this is a problem. So it's her, it was her town hall comment. They got you. Oh, okay. You got you. I'm about that line. You can hear that because it's important. You, you put that on the town hall. We saw it on the town hall. And we brought it up. Okay. Awesome. So as just a follow up, um, so I do homeschool both of my kids. We spend a great deal of time like at our park. Uh, we've had to stop going out specifically because of middle schoolers. Um, some of people we're familiar with, so we do call. I do the MPs and contact them on the emergency line. Um, it's not necessarily that it's anything that kids can respond to and stop. But how do, like, what as parents, as residents in the neighborhoods are we required to do to keep them out of our neighborhoods after school, before school, during school? Like, what is the garrison doing to keep them from branching out across the base where they're not supposed to be, but who's stopping? So that's, that's where a bar could come into place. Okay. Now, we have to identify them. Mm -hmm. individuals and that's good discussion and it's like anything else without having the details if, if you called and it took 25 30 minutes for someone to respond and therefore the kids were long gone uh, that's a challenge that we can address and we got the right people here if you call and we showed up in, in you know in the two to five minute response time and that information stopped there then that's just something we need to be aware of because Sometimes people do what they think is best for the situation, mm -hmm. and they think, well, I've fixed the situation. Like, we've exactly. secured the gun, there's no issue. That was an obvious one where everybody knew, okay, no, this will be a concern. We need to broadcast this wider. In that case, I would not be surprised if a policeman went, okay, I shoot them off the property, I don't see a concern, but they're not looking at the patterns. So, uh, it would help give Colonel Bremen, some of those details that, especially because you've been there, you see it, you see it play out, uh, because that is one of the avenues we do have. And I suspect that the school doesn't know. So just yeah. like if my neighbor's kid is at home, and I see that they didn't go to school, I tell the neighbor, hey, uh, your daughter was here all day, just want to make sure you knew that. 
That is one of the things that we'll do. Do you realize you've got a child checking in for accountability and it disappears? I'm sure you would like to know. Ma'am, are you, is the assumption that the kids at the playground at that time are non DOD? So the kids, well, no, the kids tell us. So when we confront them, I don't know if there's other, there's some residents in here who are in similar situations. The kids are, one, very aggressive with us as adults, whether it's cussing at us, threatening us. Um, they do it to our kids. They're not afraid to tell us that, hey, call me abuse doesn't matter. You're not, I mean, you're not going to do anything. You're not from here. What are you going to do? And this is even my neighborhood, so what do you can do about it? Sort of things like that. And it's there have been somewhere um, as residents we can identify. This is for key offenders, obviously. Um, but for the most part, those kids have no problem telling us as adults, basically, go after themselves. And they tell us that they're civilians, like, what are you going to do about it? So there's really nothing we can do about it. Well, photos would help too. Right? That would be my follow-up question is that we have been led to believe that we can't do that. That we either can't video them, we can't take pictures of other people's kids or things like that. Okay, I'm looking at my lawyer. Uh, do you know off the top yes. of your head? There is no reasonable expectation of privacy in okay. their public Also be here enough loud. Because there's a lot of discord within our community as well on whether or not that's allowed. So it's right. awesome to hear that. They don't want to say I have this photo and then found out you got in trouble because Exactly. So there's Basically, we've had a lot of problems, not just with the kids on kids, but the kids coming from the school and and threatening behavior towards adults as well. Okay. Um, and those are things that, like, as, as the colonel said, that you can collaborate with. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. That's, that's Glad great. You're right. Thank you. I appreciate it. What was the line got long? Yeah, it did. By the way, nobody is under sure. obligation, well, except us, um, to hang out here. So. If anybody needs to leave, I just want to say I appreciate your time uh, that you've devoted. I'm not rushing anybody out. But... I won't be offended. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, I'm Jackie Kaler. I'm a um, mom of a seventh grader at MacArthur Middle School. So really grateful for everybody here and for the teachers, grateful for the military partnership. I work with the Coast Guard as part of my job, and I'm just like so proud to you know work with them. They're great partners, and I know you guys are too. Um, so I think we should keep taking advantage of that partnership. Um, I had a question about the, the shooting, um, not shooting, the potential, you know, the gun incident, I should say. Was there supposed to be a lockdown? Because in case another kid brought a gun, perhaps one of the kids who didn't speak up about the other kid, was there supposed to be a lockdown? Because in my experience, usually there would be some kind of lockdown, just to see if any other kid has a weapon or anything else is going on, but there, that didn't happen. So that would be my first question. Should I pause there? Or? Okay. I mean, the answer, the, the short answer is in that, for that particular situation, in that, that, that it was handled appropriately by the administration. Because when the administration was told about it or found out about it, again, the student did not have the weapon. Uh, there was another individual that did. Right? So that, that was not excluded. And they don't. So, without getting too much into the Well, before you say another so, individual, it was not another student. Okay. That did so there was no there was no threat. Since there was no threat at that time, then there was no need for Okay, thank you for clarifying that. And then with the transparent backpacks, I mean, I've dropped and dropped off and picked up my daughter enough to know that it's just not always um, happening. Like some kids just do wear backpacks that you you can't see through them. And um, I just want to know, like, is there something that maybe would be done to enforce that or to um, help that to actually uh, happen? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, every morning, um, during morning announcements, I get on the uh, PA system and I remind the students about the behavior expectations. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we do have three administrators, we have three on one, and then we have um, a large amount of fantastic teachers. Um, the teachers and the alt ones, the administrators, we do a diligent job throughout the day um, observing students as they move class to class. Um, double checking to make sure that only clear and mesh backpacks are being used. Um, if we do uh, see any sort of um, fanny packs, purses, backpacks that are not clear or mesh, um, we just uh, escort the student uh, to the office or we ask them whether or not they need a backpack. We would escort them to the office to get the backpack. Um, sometimes the student says, you know what, Mr. Whiting, I understand we're not supposed to uh, um, carry the backpack throughout the day. Let me just put my items in my locker, or the bag in my locker, and just carry what I need to need um, throughout the day. So if we, the um, 
non-transparent book bag, we have a conversation with the student and we give them the backpack. Do, do you or do you have the authority to search a backpack if it is an opaque backpack? If, if, if we suspect. And the last question would be, um, my daughter is being bullied and she doesn't, she's new to the school, she's not sure who to tell. I, I encourage her to tell a teacher that she trusts, but she doesn't really feel like she has somebody to tell. So I was wondering, like, can I get involved or, you know, who should she go to about that? What was the first part? I'm sorry. Wait, I didn't hear my daughter's, being, daughter's being, bullied. being bullied. Oh, yeah. being bullied. Being bullied. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what, what grade your daughter is in. But um, I, I ask is, like, oh. before you leave, connect with him or connect with this relief and get the name so you can, like, look into this and then so someone can call you back and to you. There we go. But the short answer is yes. Parents, I hope I would get at this out of today. Parents are your, your kid's Please. best advocate. So that's part of why we're here today. If you, don't, if you see something, say something right. And, Mr. Williams, connect. Hi there. Sorry, I'm a little camera shy, so I'm trying to get a little bit of But um, I am Ms. Um, Mastery. I am a kindergarten teacher at West Navy EC. Um, I don't really have a question for the kindergarten, but everybody else is using something, so I should do. Um, my question is are there safeguards put in place for the social emotional needs for middle schoolers and high schoolers because I know at the kindergarten level there are. Uh, for example, in my classroom and all other classrooms at my school, we have what we call vengeance and that's where we send our students to go if they feel extremely frustrated, um, just you know, free feelings, and that's where we send them. So do we have those safeguards in place in the classroom? Um, my follow-up question is, my second that came all right so um at macarthur middle school we do we do have teachers that have a space um, somewhere in their classroom for students to take that mental time out. Um, we also offer our teachers manipulatives that they can use um, uh, when they have students that want to have a time out. Um, we also offer uh, restorative practice. You're an Anne Arundel County teacher. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Um, the student can always go to their counselor or a teacher or their administrator, say that they're having a problem with another student and the counselor or administrator will walk that student through and maybe the other student um, they're having a conflict with and um, walk through that restorative practice um, session. Um, we do offer a lot of quality activities after school. Um, uh, our counselors also offer after school um, groups too. So it would just be, um, it would just, we would just need the student to speak up and say, you know what, I need to, I, I would love to be a part of that group after school. You have room for me so that they could be a part of it. And here's what you're going to find in middle and high school, that as you get older, like, even, if, you know, with, with me being a principal and with the daughter of high school, they, you know, having them up front say, I'm being bullied or having, that's where it gets different. So with, with some of the, whether it's advisory or flex or with some of the after school clubs or with some of those lessons that we talked about that says, if you're experiencing problems, like, Here's what you need to do. That's where those, like you said, those relationships come into play, right? right? And, and I think that what Mr. Whiting is talking about is having safe spots, but also having opportunities for staff and kids to have interactions with each other, whether it's with the teachers or with the counselors, so that you know once they get comfortable with them, they'll be able to communicate that. But that's that's what some of those advisors and flex are for. It's for opportunities for connections between adults and kids. Um, those are things that we obviously have to want to continue to do. Um, but but that's that's what this is for. Okay. I didn't think I would have a follow up question, but I do. Um, are we allowed as teachers <coughs> to say, "Hey, Shannon, do you mind staying a little bit after school so that we can talk through some things that I'm noticing, or just so you know, 
So I would say if you if you have a concern about a, a child as an educator, right, the first thing that, that I would always advise my my staff to do is to talk to the counselor, right? So the teacher talk to the counselor uh, in the, in their administrator and they come up with the game plan, right? And, and then you know counselors, psychologists, they are trained uh, to to help navigate those situations with the principals. So you have that two or three person like triage and they come up with the plan. Thank you. Um, okay, I, I want to clarify something you said earlier. Um, we were talking about the thing hats and the purses, and so students are no longer allowed to have them as right. a result of what happened. Yes. Is this countywide or just at the garden? So, so my first thought is one, that's not equitable, and second, does it get a little uncomfortable? Apologies, not really, but you know. Um, so, there was about some uteruses in Mid Street. And those of us who have uteruses, whether we were assigned female at birth or for those who are transgender, they were relying on those skinny packs and those purses to carry their feminine products discreetly, especially our transgender middle schoolers. Um, it is very, very crucial that they can carry their feminine hygiene products discreetly. Um, because they have those queer backpacks, which I, I understand the need for, they need to carry those products discreetly. And do you know why there was a fanny pack with a gun? Because they allowed it for... I I understand that. I understand that. But for a transgender student, the bathroom is one of the most unsafe places for them, and they need those products. Right. And if they're visible in a clear backpack, and even for me as a girl, um, y'all don't really need to know this, but I bled for two weeks straight. I had to go to the bathroom every single hour or it was a hot mess, okay? And if I had to go to my locker to get a pad or a tampon, every hour I was late to every single class. I had to carry the lead. Uh, boys freaked out when a tampon fell on their backpack. So that purse was essential to keep it discreet. So which one of those do you care more about? The discretion? Um, the I cared about all the boys in my class not making mad fun of me. No, um, I mean, and it yeah, was in Canada, so yeah, that's my concern. But here's the thing: Are we? How often? Do we, I know. I know it's not an easy answer. That's why we're having this conversation, right. and it's something we need to think about. What happened at MacArthur could just as easily happen at any middle school in our county, right? So, are we removing fanny packs and purses from every single middle school and high school in our county? That's why I ask. Is it just MacArthur that has made this ban, or is it every single middle school and high school in our county? I mean, on the same day this incident happened at MacArthur, a kindergarten teacher was shot in Virginia, right? No, sorry, first grade teacher by a six-year-old student, intentionally shot, right? This can happen anywhere. So So removing a fanny pack isn't the answer. I'm sorry. So so don't they have? This is what my daughter does. They have the little one in the It's called a little period bag. That's what I'm giving it up, right? She puts it in her bag, whatever. It fits in your pocket. She puts it from her clear book bag. Puts it in her pocket and goes to the bathroom. I I can't get concerned, but I'd rather it be small, whatever. It's still closed up. I can send it a link to you. But I'd rather have that than them saying the baby pack with a gun or something. I'm just saying. Well, I was, yeah, I was just going to say, Catherine, um, for today's town hall specifically, what happens in the rest of Anne Arundel County is much different than what happens on Fort Meade right. and what we I need to do here on Fort Meade. Yes, I think it's very important. Yeah. And so, so this is something that I wanted to get at and think about. Okay. Yeah, so to be honest, you asked the question if this happening at other schools, and I don't know the answer yeah. to that right now, but I hear what you're saying. And, and it's something that we just but I also want us to think about our transgender okay. students who might have a very real problem now right. using right. disabilities. Right. Thank you. This is, I haven't spoken on that. Okay, so ma'am, just so you are tracking, one of the first conversations we had as staff, this is everything you brought up, is just know please that Merrick is your school liaison officer, is tracking both females, transgender, and everyone. 
This is one of the first things we talked about. Commander is aware. It's part of the discussion. And the reason I smiled when you started wasn't because I thought the situation was funny. Okay. It was because as I That's sat true. there with Principal Whiting and we were talking about this the, the day, the morning after, yeah. and he said that he'd been having this discussion for about six years mm -hmm. with his staff because they made the argument of fanny packs and nurses should be okay for just that reason. And this was what changed it, right? Why did we start searching people before they got on to gates uh, to get onto their plane? Because there was a threat that changed. There was a situation that changed the environment. And so in the interest of safety and security, we removed some of the privacy aspects that we had. So I, like on the garrison side, I, uh, we had the discussion on the school side, I know they had. And so while that was a consideration, Oh, and I think she uh, went to the back. But that's exactly where we ended up falling. Uh, well, I can't say too much about my own kids, right? They would really be embarrassed. Uh, but same thing, right? Thick pads are used. And so that's one of those that we had the discussion, even in my own household, of what kind of pencil case would suffice. And that's where ultimately a, a pocket is where it's got to go. And but for that's some of us, but I'm saying that's not sufficient. Especially women's pockets, right? Yeah. Uh, which is a whole other topic that we can hit. So it, it was not made willy nilly. The discussion was. Well, I, I understand. And it will continue to be a doesn't make decisions willy nilly. Right. I, I understand. And, and, I, and I respect that. I and from an equality, equality is based on the equity environment. Not What's that? Equity. Not right. From an equity, uh, my favorite example. Equality is everybody gets a pair of boots. Equity right, is you get a pair of boots in your size. Uh, but from an equity standpoint, uh, the schools have different needs. Some schools will have meta metal detectors in some ones. Oh, please don't put metal detectors in our school. You're putting it's like putting our students no. in a barrel. In a barrel? Right. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. Like you're actually making them a bigger target. Don't, okay. don't, let's not use I, I don't know anything about that. But just, because that. people bring up metal detectors, equity is not something that's going to, because every school has different needs. Right? We have an IB school, not every school in Anne Arundel County right. is an IB school. So just recognize that decisions are based on the environment and on the security situation. But we, are, we have acknowledged and have actually already discussed these in details. And Meredith will continue to be a huge advocate because she truly has every single child in mind. He's So I'm not actually a former parent to a MacArthur Middle School kid. I actually pulled my kid from your school um, due to bullying issues and my lack of trust that it was being dealt with. Um, in saying that, there is also obviously this theme of a lack of trust of things getting taken care of. Um, as is evidenced by the percentage of students from our military community attending that school. It is a daily com conversation on our Facebook pages of where can I live that's not Fort Meade. Um, and that actually hurts, right? We want them to live here. Um, we want our post to be somewhere where you want to be. In saying that, a lot of that for me comes down to communication. And it seems like there's a lack of understanding of what on the military side we would call our chain of command. Um, is there a way to send a proper chain of command, who to follow up with, up that chain, out to those families so that they know who to go to when something isn't being handled? Instead of consistently asking, just getting a standard top to bottom, here's what it looks like as you go. I'm looking at you and hopefully... I think the PT, the administration can do that, but I, that's where, to me, like a PTSA is very, very important. Because if they were speaking as a high school principal, right, and I told you about the over 300, my PTSA president was, was like right at my head. So if they were concerned, right, they knew exactly who to contact, right? We had the, every other month meeting, broadcasting what it is, and, and he would still like email the emails that he got. I'm sure that that happens now. So the answer is yes, I can help support that. But my, my strong advice for any parent, right, is to make sure that they're connecting with the P a PTSA president and officers so that that could be communicated that way, right? Along with the school, right? 
but a PTSA president is, is a big help with that in the PTSA too. You talked about like like families and, and you know and, and having you know pulling your, your child out, which is you're right. I, I, I understand that, but I also wanted to like just go back to the stats that I said earlier, right? Because you know. I, I know that that was a situation with the gun that's very serious, but again, when I look at the stats and we talk about it, MacArthur's referrals and MacArthur's fighting against are like in the middle. So I think that one of the things we have to probably do a better job of is communicating, right? We can't communicate with, you know, who's ahead probably, but just making sure that we know that. MacArthur is not more violent than other middle schools. MacArthur doesn't have more incidents than other middle schools. There are more, there are some of the schools that have more incidents that we have to deal with, right? So just making sure that we are educated here is something that, that we have to make sure we do too. Okay. Okay. So, sir, that is, we've run out of questions, or at least we've gotten through here. So with that, do you have any closing comments you'd like to? I, I do want to check. Did anyone else have any questions? Is it, they think they're, I don't want to prematurely answer. Okay. Well, I'll offer up, right, since this is my event, I get true closing comments. If anybody else is <laughs> No, I, I haven't been, for me, again, I uh, I haven't been in this hall in, in some time, so to bring that good memories, high school principal memories, and I just uh, want to thank everyone for coming out and, and giving us the opportunity to talk about our schools and our wonderful, wonderful clusters. We look forward to seeing you all at the, the next meet. Uh, uh, strong men, which will be sometime this week. Okay, and then what I, I mean, I've said it a couple of times, and I, I want you to understand, I truly mean in the sincerest ways, uh, I, I thank you. And there's a whole lot of layers of what I thank you for, uh, for our educators, because you're doing what a lot of people aren't anymore, and more and more people aren't even interested, and you're doing it under increasingly stressful situations. So for any of our educators out there, thank you. Uh, for the parents who are here, you are here because you care about your children, you care about your community. Uh, if anybody is here and neither an educator nor a parent and doesn't work for me, uh, that, uh, that means you care about the community writ large and much bigger. And so I also want to thank you for that too. Uh, I appreciate the attendance that we had here because that was one of our concerns is that we would um, bring everybody together and then we'd have two or three people that actually made it this this uh, so it's hard to believe this but the this town hall is not the result of a gun being brought to the car uh, that is one of the things that is I came on and public affairs informed me about all these online town halls and I said oh I hate that idea not that I hate town halls but I need to see people I need to engage and I, I fully realize a lot of the best conversations and what you get out of it aren't what's said in this audience. It's what happens off to the sides or in the back and, and as you meet each other. So we had this long-term plan to how we get there because when people aren't used to doing something besides Facebook, it's hard to get out. The other factor is, is I keep getting reminded, is sir, if we do something in person, hybrid doesn't always work and you're potentially risking not reaching out to more people. So there's a balance. The other, but we are going to do more in person for the installation. The other factor, while the MacArthur gun incident uh, sped up our timeline of getting the school board here, why well, you're not the school board? Sorry. I, <laughs> I'm not a educator. I, yeah, that is not a way to mix metaphors. Um, that's like calling the sergeant sir or ma'am. I'm like, I work for a living, I got it. Uh, so it, it's getting community school reps here uh, was part of the goal. I want to have themed town halls where we get more Corvius sitting with us. We get the family advocacy rep and the Army Community Services rep. And then we have more representation of what the installation offers. And uh, because it is all about this community. And so I, the, my final thanks is to you all because I recognize that based on the time, I really did want to do this without it having to be a stressful uh, catalyst that brought us together. And uh, so I, I appreciate that, that you're here. So you that are still here, 
there are budget efforts going on right now uh, that they put their priority on being here to communicate with the town hall. And I think that's, I hope I'm not, if that doesn't need to be posted online because I get you in trouble, let me know. We'll, we will cut that part out of the video. I received permission. You did? Okay, good. I don't hear me walking. Um, but the fact is that there is also something else that was demanding their time. And they cared enough about you all, they cared enough about us, the relationship, and the situation uh, that they are here instead. And so I appreciate that. So, uh, if there are, I will stick around for a little while. I live like two blocks away, so I've already missed dinner. I, I can hang out without getting into trouble. Uh, if you have any follow up questions for anyone in particular, please just let us know. Thank you. Have a good night.